but everything sounded good. Okay. okay. Also, um, cause we normally send it right when we get off that way. Um, like if you close your computer, you don't lose it. You don't have to email it. You just go to wetransfer.com and it sends it for you. Do you want me to try doing that right now? Um, if you want to, but it's, if you, Adam, it's up to you guys, I don't mind. Adam, did you do a test already with her? I haven't though. No. So I, I mean, can do yeah, that. I think that's important then. I'm recording right now too. So I'll send you my yeah, test as well right now, Adam. Yeah, so if you, if you I will do the same. And send it and then I can quickly, I'll check okay. it and give you guys to it. All right. We get to that and then I'll stop the recording right now. Okay. One second. Stop. The stop is the black button. I know it's I always try and push the red button. But... The test. And then Jessa, do you want to walk through, you know how to get, how to send it so you go x you go file tell me no what hold on one second it. it's not okay so wait i have to sign up right now for we transfer is that what i have to do you don't have no, to no. sign up oh uh, it's just a uh, website i'm on the we transfer.com and it's saying add to your files email to your yeah. email all of that do i have to do that yeah so did you so what did you do with the audacity test did you save it um no so okay, tell me so, how to do that yeah so go on audacity and then click file yep. Yep. And on file, go down to um, export, and then go to wave, W-A-V. Got it. Okay, yep. and then put in there, like, Jessa test or whatever you want to put. Save that. And say okay on the next screen. That asks you some bullshit that doesn't matter. And Save then... it as uh, documents? Yeah, that's fine. Uh, save as wave. No, no. Yes, you... okay. yeah, save oh, okay. Documents, okay. fine. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. So test, okay, and then do what? Press okay for the next one? Yeah. Okay. And then go that. to wetransfer.com now on your Safari or wherever. I see it. Yeah. And click on add file. I'm doing it with you, so I'm, that's what I'm going to do. Hey, Adam. So. Adam, mine just sent to you. Okay. You're on Take Me to Free or whatever on WeTransfer, right? You just done the free one. Um, yeah. So add your file, find your file there in Got that. documents. Okay, perfect. And then include that and put Adam's email address. Adam, what's your email address? Uh, Adam at Red Fox Audio. Dot com. Redfoxaudio.com. Okay, let me get my email. And then off the test. Okay, so let's see. Mercedes, you wrote down like three bullet points that I can't remember besides the we can take anything out. Yeah, I did. They're downstairs. I could go grab them, I guess, while Adam's testing. Be right yeah, it's down. on 27%. Perfect. Okay. Okay, let me just check Jade's. Uh. Okay, and you should have got mine as well. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Let me see. Uh, yeah, it's just come through. Okay. I'm just going to quickly drop off the call, girls, um, and I'll be back in one minute. We'll just want—I just want to check the audio. Okay. okay go for it. All right. Okay. So, uh, oh, just to eliminate. Any, of course, like extra noise that might be going on in your house background, et cetera, if you can, because otherwise it'll come out echoey and scratchy like our last. Our last I like time. that you're like lounging on the couch because it's like we're really getting to like conversate with you. Like it's, this is it's my really... life right here. <laughs> I live right here. But it's so here. much more personal than people are. I mean, I know you do like stories and stuff where you're like lounging, but it's like so much more personal than you would probably see in a podcast. Yeah. You know? Usually it's in a studio. So. Well, and that's what I, when I had my podcast too, I felt um, it was very rushed and it was kind of cold. Like it wasn't as warm and fuzzy feeling, I think, as this is as well. Mm -hmm. It was more stage and more production and it had all like the the flair to it and so people were kind of like mm, they, they felt like they had to be on their best behavior and how they spoke yeah. would translate and being more like a not so genuine I guess yeah mm -hmm. yeah okay girls so uh Jessa and Mercedes yeah. sounding great Jade can you just um just confirm that 
in Audacity, you are using your mic because you don't sound how you usually sound. Uh, my mic is definitely farther away from me this time. Um, but in Audacity, I've push. got... Oh, no, it was not. Okay. Ooh, good catch. Uh, it's actually not even an option. Okay, so maybe you need to restart and plug your mic. Um, wait, where does where am I supposed to be seeing it? Uh, where it says built-in microphone. Mercedes, can you can you help us? I don't have Audacity open right now. Which yeah, is it? The gonna... one on the left. Uh, so you have core audio to the very left, Jake. Yeah. No. Um. Shit. Let me open it up. Uh, no, I. Yeah, core audio. Okay, then the next one should be Yeti stereo microphone in the middle. Yeah, left. it's not giving me that option. And is your mic obviously the okay. the is it plugged in properly? Is the light on on it? These dang toddlers. Give me a second. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about this, guys. Oh, everything's fine. Um, Jessa, while she's doing that. So the other things, obviously, like I was saying, eliminate any noise if possible. Even if you have your AC going, if it's like you're in a place where it's loud, it's awesome if you turn it off for just our little the time we spend here. Um, try not to disturb the microphone either on your earphones or on your computer, whichever. Were you using earphones or are you using your, just your computer? I'm sure. pretty sure it's just the computer. Okay. So yeah, yeah, I don't think there's anything on here. Yeah, just if you have papers or anything like that, just don't. We had problems with them rubbing on there before, so just want to make sure that's said. And then um, be as liberal as you would with us if we were just having a girlfriend chat because we obviously want to hear everything you have to say and get as deep into anything you want to get into as possible. And you will have last cut on anything in the... La, uh, la, 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 la. In the, edit, better. In the edit of the episode. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> we'll basically send you the episode and make sure you're good with everything that was said prior to using it so does that make sense? Uh, the one thing that i do want to change maybe is some lights because i feel like it's just going to get darker and darker in, in my room oh yeah you're by second. daylight yeah you turn on some lights okay yeah it was um Unplugged. probably not like pushed in all the way okay. and so it wasn't coming up as an option but now i have it on there okay cool 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 so i guess we'll just i'll, I'll wait for jessica to come back and remind her to hit record again on audacity then i'm gonna to have to leave you girls to it is okay, that cool okay. jade you're recording now on audacity and mercedes are you going with the ecam as well yeah right. i am um ecam's okay. already going okay, okay so i'm gonna send this to you real quick okay, uh, excuse me. adam i think that the audacity is gonna have the test at the beginning of it is that okay that's fine okay yeah, that's just absolutely continuing fine. To, from that point i guess yeah. Jessa, did you remember to hit record again in the Audacity software? No, are we ready to go? Just start Just start um, it now. He'll just, match just, it up. Just start it now, just so we, <laughs> God forbid, no we forget. Because we uh, we're, we're scared we'll forget. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then the, so when you start it, you'll see the green line bouncing, the green yeah, thing bouncing. Yeah, it's on. Okay, perfect. Awesome. All right, Adam, All right, I Adam. sent it to you. It's done. Okay. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hang up and leave you girls to it. Um, again, gonna... Jessa... Are you checking Jade's test before gonna, we start? I'm gonna. I'm, oh yeah. Let me check. Let, yeah, let, just let, check. Let, let me hang up and then I'll 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 give you the all clear. Okay. Thanks. Did for... you send it already? Yeah, I've yes. got it. Uh huh. Okay. It's only like a minute long. Thanks, Jessa, for hanging in here with our. <laughs> it's all right. I actually but... don't have uh, kiddo, so I have the night to myself tonight. Oh. oh. I know. Fancy. Yeah. Uh, that didn't. That sounds foreign to me. <laughs> It actually isn't as cool as you think it would be. You kind of okay. just like, fuck, it's like quiet. Good to go. Huh? What, Good Adam? to go. Good okay. to go, guys. Okay, have fun. And, uh, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming on, Chester. And um, just be patient with the upload at the end uh, because yeah. if, obviously it'll be a big file to upload, so it may take yeah. like 20, 25 minutes. Adam, are you uh, coming back here. on tonight? Or no, he's... I don't think so. But okay. I, if, if shit is the fan... Just call me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. We will. I'll try to also remember to remind Jessa about that because I always am the one who shuts my computer early <laughs> and fucks that up. So I'll okay. remember, hopefully I'll remember. You girls have got this. You've got it. Okay. <laughs> All yeah. right. Bye. 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 Yeah. Even when Scott takes the kids with him to wherever he goes and I have two hours, like two hours is 
the max I've ever had. Um, it's usually like on a day I'm going to do like a plant medicine ceremony and I need my time. But when he does that, I'm like, come back. I don't like it. <laughs> yeah. you miss- it's like, it's almost I want spooky. them to leave because you need the space. But the second that they're gone, it's like, I want Is them it, really? Like- also, yeah, I it's so it's weird. Something about like, I don't know, being in the, it's almost like feels spooky, not like spiritual spooky, but just like spooky, like. Where's my family? Just you know, quiet. I don't know. Like, it yeah. is. I'm saying it's real quiet. Sound, and you're just like, yeah. Fuck, I don't like this. No, I don't <laughs> know about all that. But because um, sometimes, I mean, two hours is not a lot of time. Sometimes I could spend two hours sitting on the toilet Instagramming. Like, that's not, yeah. that's not hard. But yeah. my children, you would not be doing that. Yeah, I guess. Nope. My friend no. um, has, like, they switch every week. And it's been, like, two years. And she still cries when she drops off her son. She was like, I don't know why I'm not excited to go, like, get pedicures and go do all the stuff I want to do. She's like, cries. I have no problem years. dropping my kid off. I'm like, <laughs> I need a fucking break. Go. I've had you long enough. Yeah. this I, You've got a lot that you can do, though. I don't think. I think she, like, her role really is identified as a mom. Like, she doesn't. That's another thing, too. I feel like a lot of the women that I surround myself with have the same mindset as me, where they like to work and they don't really like to stay mm-hmm. at home. I, I don't yeah. think I could be a stay-at-home wife and mom that's just not in my blood I wish it were I'd like to just (laughs) relax and have somebody pay for everything while I take care of the kids but I just would like to make things harder on myself and just have five million (laughs) jobs and children and take more children but wouldn't you you, Dan would have locked you down would you be (laughs) down to like have a nanny though I mean okay so I take my niece she's with me all the time I take my niece with me to the park and I see a lot of nannies there with just one kid and for like a second I'm just like Oh, that would be nice. Yeah. I'm like, but no, I, I don't think that I could, especially mm. if I was a stay at home mom. I don't think that I could do that. Mm. I think that that I would feel guilty about that. Like that's your job. I, so I have <laughs> someone come clean my house only once a month and she's only here for an hour and a half and I have to leave because I feel guilty being there and not cleaning while she's cleaning. Oh my God. Just, you guys are living such different lives. She only does the deep cleaning, <laughs> but I was like, I'm like, okay, we're going to go. I like pretend that we're going to gymnastics. Yeah. I'm like, okay, we got to go to gymnastics. And we're like, go just random oh, errands because I, I can't be there while she's cleaning. See, I'm there like, bitch, you stealing something from me? <laughs> <laughs> You're worried yeah. about shit? Like in the room. I don't have anything I'm to like, steal. I'm like, why didn't I just fucking clean this room? I'm standing here like, nah. Not me. See, no, that took me a while, though, to be like that, because I, I was thinking in my head, like, $120 for somebody deep clean my house. I'm like, yeah. no, like, I could save that money. I'm like, oh, no. I don't want to only- fucking do baseboards. <laughs> no, you can come to my house. I'll no. pay you the $120. So that's part of the reason why I hired her is because she's my – my friend is a teacher, and she teaches this woman's kids. And she, this woman, like, really needed work, and she only charges me 65 so I end up giving her 80 But that's, like – nothing. I mean – that can't really be bought. Like what she does in here, and Scott doesn't know, um, but she only speaks Spanish. And every every now and then, Scott uh, so will tell Scott like, the "Spanish lady was here." Papa, you're muy guapo. And Scott's <laughs> like, "Where are you learning Spanish?" <laughs> and I'm like, crazy. "That's hilarious, dude." That's I'm so like, "Oh, YouTube." <laughs> No, I definitely I pulled it off for three months now. Oh my god! I grew up with a Spanish nanny, and I mean, there was no communication. It was pointing, and like after like five years of her living with us, I don't think we even learned like wow, five words. Down? That's sad. That my this lady and soul have a connection. Like Aww. they like talk as if they speak the same language. It's really weird. that's, that's so adorable. Cute. It's really weird. <laughs> I had a Spanish nanny. Her name was Sylvia, and uh, well, I don't know a nanny, but she. Well, I guess she was a nanny because she like there every day, um, <laughs> <laughs> but she didn't live there or something. Uh, but she was like, like my obviously I'm half Mexican, and my my parents don't speak Spanish. My mom is second generation and third generation, so. Um, my grandparents speak Spanish and we lived on their property at the time, but I didn't ever for some reason pick it up. Sylvia never spoke it around me. I think my mom, like my mom used to tell me we're Spanish, not Mexican for some fucking weird reason. Like she was, does it not, sound better? I think, I think at the time being we're Mexican Spain, was like an Mexico. issue, you know, like she Back grew up at a time. Up. Yeah. Or my mom, my mom grew up, I think more in a time when it was not like a good thing. It still is really a good thing. should be bilingual. It's yeah. Like- you should know Mandarin too. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like I was not going to get jobs because I spoke Spanish, Mom. Calm yes. down. Um, <laughs> I forgot that we're recording, and I know that uh, he's going to put this as an outtake, and then Scott's going to find out I have a cleaner. 
They're like, don't put that in. Please. I miss that. But I was going to say, Sylvia, though, the thing I do remember about her is that we had a big earthquake. And she put me in the closet because, like, you know, you're, like, under the, you know, she put me in the closet, like, under the door jam or yeah, whatever the fuck it's called. Yeah. yeah. And I, it was my first earthquake. So that's all I remember because it stuck with me because it's my first My earthquake. first earthquake Aww. was with you, Mercedes. Where were we? In Oklahoma, you were banging on my door and the strobe light was going earthquake? off. And I was completely naked. So I grabbed my belly to her and that's all I had. And I, was, and I was like, you're saving my life. That was life. your first earthquake? It was you an earthquake. It was a tornado. Because she never lived in, well, she only lived in California. Oh, a tornado. Time. You dumbass. Really? <laughs> <laughs> it was one of those disasters. It was in Oklahoma. There are no earthquakes there. But we went down there and all the cast was like drinking uh, wine and eating like, or dirt, I don't know, like fancy little treats. Oh, oh yeah, as if it was nothing. No, you know what they yeah. had? They had fucking um, bean but you were bruschetta. Scared. You were like in between the soda machines. Yeah, no, they had bean bruschetta. As soon as we walked down, they handed us a cup of plastic gl- cup of wine and bean. This bruschetta. is the middle of the night, and only like my second show, and I'm nude under my Bellator robe, and just had stomped through like a foot of water because the the door had slammed open. The tornado was pulling all this water into the hotel at the base of. Anyway, we're like at a Hampton Inn. You You're know, the like, crap out of me. The nice, the nice yeah, hotel. Yeah, the nice hotel. Yeah, and so nice we go one. to the front desk because we're all nervous holding our bruschetta and our wine. And we're like, <laughs> um, you know, is this, is this tornado? <laughs> yeah. Is this okay? Because the, li- the power's off. And she's like, if it was bad, the air raid siren things would go off. You'd hear it. And then literally right then, like a fucking car, it, it went off. And she's like, oh. And she's like, um, well, we don't have a shelter because we we're asking, do you guys have like a tornado shelter? She's like, we don't have a oh, shelter, yeah. but the you just want to stay away from the window so you can go into the room where the soda machine, vending machines are. And you like no got in between there. and you were tweeting about it. And I was like, what's Twitter? Because it was only like my second show and I had no social media. <sighs> this is back when we were all children, correct? Totally. <laughs> Yeah. What's Twitter? <laughs> this was what, like seven years ago now, or six years ago? I don't know. How long no, it would have been when no, Twitter like first eight. came out. Like seven yeah. or eight years ago. It was 2010 or 11. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I remember my phone was huh? fucking dying because there's no batteries back then at all. <laughs> scariest <laughs> part. <It's> terrible. <laughs> that was the scariest part. Oh, the part. problems. There was the no problems power. that we had. I couldn't ha- tell anyone I was going to die. <laughs> <laughs> terrible. Uh, Funny. Oh, I was going to uh, say, do you think we should do, like, we should just probably intro this whole episode with Jess on the phone to see how it flows. If we need to redo that part, we can later um, because it's really Well, short. I don't want to take up her time, but the intro to Jessa is long enough. Okay. Well, I, only because we reference where we met her. But either way, All right. just we just go straight in. Yeah, that way she didn't have to worry about muting herself or whatever. Yeah. Um. You've got a pretty long intro to her. Yeah, I suck. I do that sometimes. <laughs> no, it's good. That's how I want to do everybody. Um, so I would start at, uh, so without further ado. All right. I'm trying to find it. <sighs> there you go. All right, guys. Are we all settled and ready i think so um and if you have any like i don't know issues for any reason i don't know something you have to do in the middle of this just let us know we'll cut it out and we'll stop and take a moment in case there's a tornado if there's a if there's an earthquake by the way like literally last week or whatever it was did you feel that earthquake jessa here um i might have been out of town oh well i was on this not doing a podcast but we were we were um brainstorming or something yeah and I totally had an earthquake and i was like wait we're having an earthquake <laughs> <laughs> jade's like and i had a, i didn't know like it felt like i had to do something so i had to run downstairs and go like just make sure everything's nope we're all here okay bye <laughs> <laughs> everything's good like you so know, wait earthquake? where is everybody right now where do you i'm live, in jade? austin I'm that's in where you live orange county mm-hmm. okay and then what about you close to mesa Goes to Mesa. Okay, so you're it's Orange County. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. are you in Hollywood? Uh, I'm in Sherman Oaks. I'm in the same Valley. apartment, right? Then I you've been there so long. Fuck, that, I know, and I'm paying way too much be. for it. No, no. Oh, it's not rent controlled. No, of course. Santa Monica's not. rent controlled, and I know a lady who lives in a two bedroom apartment two miles from Santa Monica Beach. 
for 560 because she's lived there for 21 years and one in one apartment for 21 years her rent's 560 Five, two six. miles from the beach. I didn't know you can get rent control or whatever like that. Santa Monica. Yeah, there's all some, of Santa Monica. There's some places. Mother. Bria, my makeup artist, she has a one bedroom. It's not in the best part of town. I would not ever want to live there. Mm. But even in her area, it's, I think one bedrooms are like 17, 1800 and hers is 900 a, a month. Yeah. So it, it's ridiculous. Yeah. Tex- None mine, of Texas has rent control. Damn. That's what you do when you have kids. You stay someplace because his school you have to, yeah. being here because it's fucking school. And when I was growing up, people would say that like, "Oh, we're gonna move to whatever state because yeah. it has the best schools." I'm like, "Who gives a shit? You're gonna learn the same stuff." And then now that you have kids, you're I like, know. "But that matters." That yeah. Matters. <laughs> and yeah. in another state, you could just afford to buy a house and fucking stay there. <laughs> you know? I mean, Vegas. <laughs> Vegas actually sounds real nice right, right? now with yeah. the prices. I yeah. was looking at um, what is it, Zillow, and I was pissed because. I could have just stayed there and saved so much money and they have private schools there, Yeah, but nothing compared to his school now. Like he's oh. obsessed with it and I really like it. Well, so Scott, got, Scott just got offered a ton of money to open up uh, and run a weed farm in Oklahoma because it, it's going to be legal at the start of next year. And so they already bought the land and they're like ready to go. Um, and it's super cheap, but it's Oklahoma. Like, mm-hmm. I mean, he's like, what, what if we did it for it. two years and made a lot of money, but. That is a really, really hard what for me. I felt so bad because he was super like excited. Like, guess what? We're finally mm. out of the bar industry. And I was like, mm. did you consider New Mexico? <laughs> like, because they're about to make it legal too. So I was like, I don't know if Oklahoma would be my last better. choice. Yeah, I couldn't tell you. Like, if I had to live anywhere besides California or maybe New York, like I couldn't It'd be tell Colorado you. Colorado for me. Live. Really? Colorado oh. for me. Mm-hmm. Where, I'd have I, to go and stay there for a minute to just check it out to see if I could even fathom living there. Yeah. I don't even know where I would live. I'm th- I love Orange County. I would live in Orange County. Well, yeah, mm-hmm. that's but here still, still. California. Yeah. yeah. Fucking pricey. Hmm. If I could right. live anywhere, it would be Lucadia, which is in Encinitas. It's in between San Diego and L.A. Pricey, though, still. Yeah. It looks like Hawaii. Oh, you can't even find a place to live. Nobody leaves yeah. there. Yeah, it's Hawaii. That it looks like Hawaii. Then. It's so beautiful. We want to buy a house in Bali and like live there half time. I mean, that <laughs> sounds like the dream. <laughs> I know, but it's like such an upside down. You can't actually buy a house in Bali. I think yeah, you have to like rent it from the government or some shit. But mm. it's well, that's nice. It's cheaper. You can get a mansion for forty thousand yeah. dollars. Yeah, so. I want to take Kyler there. I just can't. He won't do the flight. It's so like long. there's no way. I know, yeah. and I really want to take him there, but there's you just be have no to way. get a really cool layover halfway. Yeah, for a, like a couple. I days. got a layover in. Um, Go to Taipei. Uh, I got a layover. I, I, we used to fly to Taipei all the time because of um, top rank. But I mean, I didn't like anything there. Maybe I didn't see all the. I got like, a nice layover spots. in Beijing and climbed the Great Wall of China. There you That's go. And it was. It it totally made that flight not seem Way better. Like breaking it up, it was like I was I was happy to get back on that flight yeah. after that excursion. Can you go? <laughs> where can you go? Which way do you fly? You fly over Hawaii, right? That direction. You go that way. Yeah, where you're coming from. So nothing else is really closer because you're in the middle of the fucking ocean. So I don't know. Mm-hmm. Well, I'll just have to wait a few years. <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to pay for his flight if he's going to bitch the whole time. I'm good on that. All right, guys. If we keep yep. chatting, you know we're never going to get this fucking thing done. <laughs> and it's we funny because every day. everything we've talked about has not had anything to do with the previous thing. No, of course not. It just not. sounds like outtakes are ready. It's, scattered it's, like, it's like it chopped itself. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. You know what, though, I might do? Even though you can't hear it, it's gonna. I'm going to be pissed if you guys play it back and you can hear it in the background. It's like um, a humidifier, but it's like it's silent. But I feel like you might pick up something, so I'm going to turn it off. Okay, yeah. Okay, good idea. Hold on. <sighs> I don't know why my room gets so hot when I do these. Maybe it's because my nerves. Mine gets super hot because I have to close the door and turn off the AC. And it's fucking hot here. Right now. Well, I have my fan even on this time. I got I had them tighten it to where it didn't make noise. Because mm-hmm. remember, I would always turn it off. I had them tighten oh. it. Still sweating. Oh, yeah. That, when, you was like, when you were like, uh, turn off the air conditioner if it's on. I'm like, I know. <laughs> I my know. husband is like, Chris is like. Mine's not loud. Cool. So he I turned it to on. 68 for like the hour before this so that it would be cold enough. He could Should turn I? it off. For, yeah. <laughs> oh, Lord. Um, which is funny because just before this, he was like in the steam sauna. Like we have like one of those little funny steam saunas that you're sitting in after working out. So like, well, you're putting your temperature up to like a million degrees right now, but so you're, you're worried mm-hmm. about, I don't know. Whatever. The, the heat. In yeah. The house. <laughs> yeah. Men. Men. Mm. All right, guys. 
Don't get us started. Here we go. I know. Don't. Yeah, we'll get to that. <laughs> <laughs> so, without further ado, let me introduce today's guest, undoubtedly the sexiest redhead we know, mm-hmm. and in uh, sorry, you threw me off, Jade. An internationally, <laughs> an internationally known Playboy playmate, a lover of all genders, a fellow pizza fanatic. And perhaps, most importantly of all, the most amazing mother and soon-to-be foster mom. Please welcome our good friend, Jessa Hinton. Yay! Hi, guys. Hi, (laughs) Jessa. Hello. So, Jessa, uh, Jade and I just love you so much. And I'm not sure if this is going to come off super creepy, but I kind of hope it does. Um, (laughs) (laughs) But we decided that if we were into girls, we would definitely pick you. (laughs) <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm flattered. Thank I don't you. know. <laughs> Is that weird? <laughs> Not creepy at all. <laughs> <laughs> You're just such a dope chick, and, and we're stoked to have you on the show. So thank you for being here. No, thank you. For I feel me. like I wouldn't have to work out because I'd just be burning so many calories laughing all the time. So you'd be eating pizza together <laughs> yeah. quite often. Yeah. That's fine. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> so I've been seeing your post about becoming um, a foster mom, and I'm super intrigued on how, how this all came about. Yeah. Um, I actually, I mean, cause Kyler's 10, I have a 10 year old son and I'm not getting any younger. So I was looking into maybe even freezing my eggs. Um, I looked into just heading to the sperm bank, knocking myself up. Um, I've never believed in staying with somebody. I know a lot of women will jump into relationships because they feel like their clock is ticking. I was never somebody that believed that. I always thought that I could do it on my own. And I actually connected, um, with Angelina Jolie, once she started adopting, I'm like, you know what? I see myself doing that in the future and I, and I would be totally okay with it. So when I was looking at all of my options, adoption was more on, on the list, not really fostering. And then I think honestly, I saw an ad about fostering in this whole process of me trying to figure out what I wanted to do. If I was going to close up the baby maker for good, if I was going to give Kyler a sibling, or if, I just wanted to travel as soon as Kyler was out of the house. Like I didn't know, but I wanted to keep my options open and I started looking into fostering and something just went off. It was like a light bulb that I went from zero to 60 and I just, I, I got all the facts. I was blowing up my social media. People were like, whose account is this? Cause we <laughs> don't understand. But the outreach that I got from people interested and people that have been interested was amazing. So not only did I learn a lot and I become, I became involved, but a lot of people that follow me, male and female were asking um, advice and asking questions and how they could help out. So it actually became this domino effect that I'm very proud of. Cool. That's awesome. How has the process been? Has it been like easy or frustrating? I saw some of your posts today. So no. So I actually, um, I didn't know (laughs) that this was going to be a Skype video call. So this is me (laughs) from six in the morning when my child got up to go to school. Um, as soon as I dropped them off, I literally started knocking on doors because people won't call you back unless you're going to um, offer them money. So our foster mm-hmm. care system, they don't really care about volunteers. They don't care about how many followers I have that want to help out and donate blankets and, and clothing and stuff. All they want to see is a check. And I understand that they need money for um, these kids. But if I don't know where it's going, I'm not going to blindly donate. That's not something that I'm personally into. So I, for everybody that didn't return my emails or my calls, I went and I stopped in and I was turned away almost every single time. I have a meeting tomorrow morning that I hope is going to go well. It's with a foster agency out here. The only thing that I feel that really hurts is these kids have no mentors. They have Mm -hmm. nobody. So you can, you can take in a kid and you can care for the kid, but a lot of these kids get bounced around, especially Mm -hmm. ones that have had really traumatic experiences they will be returned. And these people, if you if you foster a kid, you get paid to foster a kid. So a lot of people are just doing it for the paycheck. It's supposed to go to all the needs that the kids um, require so it doesn't mm-hmm. come out of your pocket. So these poor kids that are super, you know, just wanting any kind of safety or any kind of security and, and to know that they're not going to turn out any differently as if, you know, you were to have your own child, there's nobody talking to them, telling them like, hey, I came from a bad place and I made the best of it and I'm pretty happy. So I even asked them, I said, I have a lot of friends that are connected that came from nothing and they're they're either adopted or they were homeless or there's a lot of situations that had happened. They would love to come in and speak. And it's like, you can't get anywhere with these people. These people don't even want you there. So why is your job trying to help 
find homes and, and, and find right. ways for these, for these kids to, um, become better human beings and to really have a chance. If you're not listening to anything, it's literally mm-hmm. like they're there for just a paycheck and they don't care. Mm-hmm. So for me, I'm a super passionate person and I'm taking my time to come in and, and donate, you know, as much as I can. And for you to treat me like less than mm-hmm. it, it doesn't make any sense to me. So the process has been actually very, very hard. It's, um, did you vo- voice that to them or? Oh, a hundred percent. Are you I did able to? Testing and, and, um, well, they told me I could write a letter. Okay. I, I could so write a letter. Here in Austin, I try to do um, a couple huge Christmas drives where we would drop off gifts, mm-hmm. um, and they, I did it, and they wouldn't let us drop the gifts off, and I was so upset and so hurt, and they basically said, like, I'm so sorry, but there's so many evil people in the world that, like, would hurt children, and, like, it's a way of us, like, it's a, it's part of us having to protect them. Like, we're not allowed to let people who aren't, like, already part of the system, like, come in and give or spend time like they have to be so careful which so it was like un- I understood but I was also so upset because I was so excited for those kids to get this stuff um but I and also uh, you saying about them having mentors um I don't know if you know my background but I did a similar um had a similar childhood of foster care I um like would live with one family that was either a family friend or I had run away and I was living in my car so I would stay with a friend um, and her parents at, at their house. So I hopped around a lot and I will say that no matter where I stayed, I never unpacked my bag because I, ne- I always felt like, what's the point? Like, that's a I'm shitty only- feeling. Well, and I always think about it though, like this started at age 10 and I, this was my life till I was 16. And, um, yeah, so I never felt like I belonged anywhere or to anyone. And it made it really hard, you know, later on in relationships, but I, it like, it has so much um, effect on your confidence and um, your schooling and just your, your entire future. But um, I, <clears throat> I remember the day that I went somewhere where they told me it was going to be permanent. Like I remember going in and it was the first time I had had like in a long time in years that I had had like my own room and bed and they, they were, they were so loving. And like the next morning, like wanted to know how I slept and like, actually like asked about how I was, you know? And I remember the first, the first time that I like unpacked my stuff and felt like, and I I went to high, I was um, a sophomore in high school and I went to school and I remember telling people, I think I met real live angels yesterday. Mm -hmm. And I like, that's really how I felt. I didn't feel like they were human. So. Well, also too, not even just volunteering or mentoring, to become a foster parent, it's like they're setting you up for failure. Like they want I you know. to not foster them, which is so crazy. The amount of paperwork that I've had to do is ridiculous. And and one of the things is um, if you have a sitter or say anybody is around this child for over, I think it was like mm-hmm. 24 hours they need within a, a week, check. with a week, they all have to have a criminal background check. So my mm-hmm. dad, my sister, my brother, and some my brother has a DUI. So I don't even mm-hmm. think that that my brother could be, it's just like all these things. It's like, look, I can just go get knocked up right now yeah. and have none of these. Mm-hmm. One but person these children can mess need up. you. But that's what I'm saying. That's what mm-hmm. sucks though, is there's people out there like me that are just like, geez, like what, like, what do I have to do? Like, can you just come monitor me? Like my family are great people, but yeah. you're telling me that my loving, amazing siblings made a few bad decisions and you can't even let them around this kid. And mm-hmm. I get what they're, where they're coming from because it is protection. They see some some fucked up shit, and I get that. But again, it's like, well, then for people like me, we're kind of getting the shit under the stick because of all of those horrible, horrible people yeah. doing these things to the kids. So it's like who don't have anything don't... on their background. No, nothing. Yeah, that's weird. because they're like they slip by, and, and you know they're able to um, go under the radar and scare cold. these kids mm-hmm. enough that they won't say anything. I and know. I'm hoping that the phone call that I had today on the way home is with a woman and I had a really good conversation with her on the way home right before I got here. And I'm going to meet with her tomorrow. And she sounded very loving, very eager to learn about how I want to help. And she sounded more, um, compassionate about the kids. This is the first person that I've talked to jaded yet. No, but she's been doing this for so long. And I think that Mm -hmm. she's just kind of like resilient. She's like, you know what? Everybody else can be fucked up. I'm going to still be me. And that's kind of, how I feel too. I, I don't raise Kyler the same way as a lot of parents 
do where they're super strict and they have all these rules. Kyler's grown yeah. up in, in a house of respect. I respect him. He respects me. And so hearing this woman talk, it kind of made me feel like, ah, like I could breathe because I'm yeah, not going to give yeah. up. It might be a lot tougher, yeah, don't, don't but I'm up. not going to give up. So you that's, gotta find that's the, the good, thing. the good people to deal with. Right. Exactly. I want to set you up with my friend. Um, he's the one who actually created and made it a national day, um, for the national world adoption day or world adoption day. Um, he started an organization called adopt together.com or org, And, um, they help people that are having a hard time that are like running into constant blocks after See, that's blocks. That's amazing. I wish so, I, yeah, the, the knowledge is out there. It's just, you really have to dig to find these people. Mm, yeah. His name is Hank. So, um, it's adopt together.org. Yeah, I'll send you his number. Connect. And I would, anyone else in this situation that's listening, look up adopt together.org because they are amazing. That's super yeah, helpful to have someone on your side who's been mm -hmm. through the gamut, mm -hmm. knows all the tricks. I don't know anybody. I don't know. And the few people that I've talked to in passing, I actually met my soulmate on the airplane to Hawaii. Um, she's a female, but she is, um, I think, in her 50s. And just, she's a cool, badass chick who used to be a cop. Now she picked up and moved to Maui. Like, she's just cool. And I feel like she's me when I turn 50. She did the same thing. She was a cop and saw a kid on that was abandoned or something. So she was allowed to take the kid in as foster and mm -hmm. then adopted him later. And she's like, my advice to you, honestly, is don't do it. She's like, no matter what I did, nothing was good enough. I mean, this yeah. kid had everything, private school, everything. And I was always, you're not my mom, no matter how old he was. And now mm -hmm. everything that she was saying, I was just like falling in love with until she said that. I was like, fuck, like that sucks. And I'm like, if, if I have a good support system, I did the best that I could. Like, that's totally. all I can walk away from is I did the best that I could and gave and somebody And you still a saved them from a worse off situation. A hundred percent. And you could sit there, my own kid could do that to me. Like, oh, yeah. well, you're a piece of shit. It doesn't matter, but at least they're clothed. They're not being abused. Nobody's making them feel like a piece of shit. So if I can at least offer that to one, hopefully more kids, then I did something. And I'm yeah. glad that I did that. In a way, though, don't all children, whether you have biological parents or not, you resent your parents for some things for that something. they've done. Like you're, Everyone has some sort of issues with some way they were raised. So I don't think you're going to win that battle with anybody. It's just a matter no. of them growing out of it and then getting past it and... You know, we have tools. Yeah, agreed. We have, just teach them the tools. <laughs> to, and then the as shit. soon as they turn 18, just pray for the best. Exactly. Because yeah. <laughs> you're not going to be 42 in my basement. I'm sorry. 18. I did. I did my, my job. You're, you're good my to go. My is done. <laughs> uh, how was your childhood? Speaking of childhoods and did it shape your desire to adopt at all? I grew up. Um, so I'm the eldest of five siblings. Mm -hmm. Um, we grew up, we were in, I believe it was the 94 earthquake, the one that happened in Northridge. Northridge it was 93, uh -huh. 94. We lost everything, like everything. Oh, wow. And my, my biological father, I don't talk to, I haven't talked to him since I don't even know how long. Um, and what's funny is he lives like literally right down the street, but my stepdad came into my life when I was four and he, again, growing up, I was like, you're not my dad. My dad's going to come pick me up, blah, blah, blah. Up until I think I was like 12, 13. Then I had some rough patches with my mom and my stepdad really like he he showed me no matter how bratty me and my siblings could be to him because three of us weren't his. They were my dad's. He was still there and he still worked two jobs every single day. Try to fight for full custody when him and my mom separated wow. like this man is an angel. And I feel so bad that a, a beautiful Asian woman hasn't come to take care of him because I feel like that's <laughs> what he needs in his life. If I could set him up, I would. But. I think growing up with my siblings, that made me want siblings for Kyler because I love, like I call them up anytime, any day. And we just spit movie quotes. It's like back and forth. And no matter mm -hmm. if, we're, if we're mad at each other, if I have a good movie quote and I feel like I'm going to stump you, I'm going to call you. So it's like this one weird <laughs> people, siblings have their own weird shit, for sure. but I love that I grew up and I had them when my parents weren't around. My stepdad worked two jobs. My mom was out and then I haven't, you know, I didn't see my, my biological dad. So that's kind of all we had. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Kyler right now has only child syndrome. Like I feel like he likes being an only child, mm. but only because he doesn't know any better. Mm. So I think that's the the main thing is I want to do it for him too, because he doesn't have that kind of like camaraderie, whether it's male or female. I think siblings do shape you in, in how you sure. learn to interact mm -hmm. with the rest of, of the world. And sharing yeah. and whatnot too, right? Like my husband's an only child. I'm like, you selfish. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I was going to say, I've dated people with that syndrome. Give them a sibling, please. <laughs> but you know, you know what's weird is I feel like with all of these books coming out and, you know, and, and the school that Kyler goes to, they don't 
call their teachers by like Mr. or Mrs. last name. It's their first name. And to me, I was like, wow. yeah. So it's Kyler's teacher's Karen. And I'm like, no, that's Miss Karen. He goes, no, we say Karen. I'm like, no, no, no. We say Miss Karen. So with that, they're teaching them all these new things of like independence, which I'm all for. But at the same time, I feel that the sharing and all of that is something that you do have to learn. But in, sure. I was talking to um, somebody today with foster kids. They teach them not to share because there are things that have gone on in their past that makes them want something. So if they have to give something up, then that means it's just like a, it, whatever it is, small, a piece of gum, like a toy. It, it's not a sense of safety and security. So that's something, a whole nother, you know, way that we have to yeah. think of taking these foster kids. I raised Kyler to share everything. And now how am I going to explain that to my child and, and understand the needs of this child? So there's no, there's no real book, you know, for parenting. You do the best that you can, but I don't think that your belief should change so much to where you're, you're pulling your own hair out. You're like, yeah. Oh my God. Like I feel, cause if you're, if your glass isn't half full, you can't, mm -hmm. what's it, what is it saying? Like if you, if you aren't, you, full, can't, you can't, you can't pour out what's not inside basically. Right. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Let's go. With that. <laughs> that's fine. We'll, we'll it's been it. a long fucking day today, it. but no, that's, that's good. Um, so you weren't, you weren't close with your biological parents then? No. And I try to reconnect with my dad for Kyler's sake. Mm -hmm. And again, like Kyler, I, I remember. Yeah. For, for Kyler, I wanted to, but my dad said some weird shit. I know. Um, yeah. And I was like, I'm gone. Like I can't, I can't deal with this. But even like with my mom, my mom has all these grandkids and it's not the way that I would be when I have my grandkids. Right. I'm going to be annoying. Like I'm going to be there all the time, but yeah. because you want what you don't have, right. I feel that my child always knows that no matter what, I don't care how stupid it is. Like I'm going to be there no matter what. Mm -hmm. So with my stepdad, I talk to him all the time. He hates that I put him on Snapchat or on Instagram, but it's like, I'm so proud. I'm so proud to have him in my life. And yeah. with my siblings. He thinks I'm making fun of him. I'm like, no, you don't understand. Like you're just funny by nature. I'm going to yeah. get that because that's great content. But at the same time, like I'm so thankful that you're in my life and I'm hoping some girl that's following me will set her mom up. Like with my dad, I'm just hoping that's what I yeah. want. <laughs> that's cute. Is there something that you wish that you were told as a child, like in the midst of all that? I think as a kid, have you guys both seen Drop Dead Fred? Yeah. Yes. When I was a kid. Yeah. Okay. The part where she goes back, Phoebe Cates go, goes back in time and sees her little self. She takes her out of the bed with like the ripped leg duct tape and she like holds her. I always cry at that part. I like a fucking baby because I think that the biggest thing is it is a sense of security and being told that you, you don't need anybody else to validate you that your parents will always be there to do so. And so in the movie, the mom is just always competing with her and she feels like she's never good enough. And so not so much I would tell myself now, but as a child, I would say that a lot of people that you care about are going to hurt you later on in life, but there are a lot of people that won't. So at least give people a chance. Cause I feel like I was so guarded and thinking yeah. everybody was going to bounce or I wasn't yeah. going to have, um, somebody for too long. So I always kept people at a distance, relationships, friendships, business, you know, I always was like, Oh, well, no, it's going to go away. Or I don't trust you. And I've been mean when I meet even men. I think I'm always like this weird thing and reading up on it. I'm obsessed with with reading as much as I can. I think it was, it goes back to being a kid where if my own father could just bounce when I was four, then any other guy would bounce There's or no female or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So I would keep guys at a distance especially and just think that they're all full of shit. Um, Which makes yeah, a lot of sense. Uh, sorry to interrupt you. No, I was just going to say it makes a lot of sense to – why you would feel so compassionate about foster children who don't mm -hmm. have a safe place, like a home where they mm -hmm. feel is home, you know, that word yeah. home, that safe place where they can rest their head and not be worried. It's not going to be there tomorrow. Um, it's kind of, I guess, fits into that, that uh, parental issue or that abandonment, the fear of abandonment deal that a lot of us have going on. I know I do. Well, we, we look to our parents for teaching and we look to our parents for guidance, even though we think we're independent at six years old, seven yeah, years old. They're the first ones to teach us love. We, so we, to be. we learn from them. So when these kids have nobody, even their own parents, and I'm, I'm somebody that doesn't play victim. Like I, I own the shit that I need to, and I work on as much as I can, but to have my very first childhood memory 
at four years old being put in the back of my stepdad's car. And I remember his car, the interior was red. Like I remember everything at four years old and being taken from my dad's house. And my mom puts me in the back seat with my little brother, who was, I think like one at the time. And she like turns back to me. I've never met this man in my life. She turns back to me and she goes, this is your new dad. Call him dad. Now that's my mm. first memory. And there was no like soft introduction. It was me being pulled from my dad's house, being put in a car with a man that I had never met. And this is your dad now. That's not like, that's not healthy. So if that's happening to these kids all the time where it's like, you're being pulled and ripped from whatever family they know to be put in this, you basically get processed like a criminal. Yeah. You get sat in like in mm -hmm. a room and then people judge you, look at you and they write like little notes, even if you're a baby all the way up to 17, 18 years old. And nobody is explaining anything. It's like the the bullshit reading down like the bullet points. That's it. Nobody's being compassionate. Nobody's caring about what you're going through, what you feel, because it's it's just another number to them. Right. So I was even looking into being the intermediate home, which is basically when a child is going to get called from um, being pulled away for like abuse or whatever the case is, they would call somebody to meet them there and be kind of like the the person that's like the the guidance, like mm -hmm. the, to, to basically make them feel safer or feel less scared mm. and I would be totally down for that even if I had to do that in the middle of the night like keep my phone yeah. on you know as much as you want to call me I'll be there because I couldn't imagine being a kid now being taken like that yeah and I can totally see the connection from that to you know foster and what they go through um yeah. that situation with you in the car and you know you think like man why did I go through this like this sucks this is such a dark thing but then you think it gave you such a big heart for people and all the people that you are likely going to change for the better. Well, a, lot you know, of, so. a lot of women that are interested in it, they ask me, they're like, what are the chances of the baby being? Because when you foster, it's not a guarantee the baby's going to be with you for life or the kid, whatever. Yep. They could go right back to their parents or next of kin. The, the biggest thing is um, they try to put you with grandparents or aunts, uncles, somebody that's next of kin. Sometimes the grandparents don't want that. Sometimes yeah. the aunts and uncles don't want that. So if you are the next best case scenario, you have the baby for a short amount of time. The parents can come back at any time. And of course, their first priority would be parents and then next of kin. And moms ask me, they're like, oh my God, that must be so hard. Like I wouldn't be able to do that. For me, I think I'm the best person to understand that because there is no, there's books on parenting, but you have shit that goes on in your life and it's just, maybe you need to get help. Maybe it's a wake up call, whatever it is. I know what it's like to be a mom and I would hope that that would help the parent get their shit together and do what they need to do for the fear of having their child taken away right. so if if I need to be the middle person until the parent gets on their feet I'm okay to do so if I'm the person that's supposed to take care of their kid because it's better with me I'm going to do so as well so I think that that's why the light bulb went off like wow I think I was meant to do this because in every aspect I understand I'm compassionate. I, I, I'm okay with everything. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to be sad, but I'm definitely accepting of either outcome. Yeah. In those circumstances, do <laughs> when you're fostering a child, does the, the biological parents have access to you? Like, are you able to? Well, you're supposed to go through the social worker and they set up everything. But if you go through an agency, the agency is the person that you deal with. So you're assigned mm -hmm. again to like a social worker. So there's a lot of middlemen, but you're supposed to have a second phone line. This is what they told me. So the parents could contact you if they can't get a hold of the social worker. Mm. And that's another thing that the woman was telling me. She goes, um, the person I met, she said that the, the biological parents were crazy and would like call mm -hmm. her up nonstop and just say like, I need to see my kid. And that's when the social worker will get involved and say, you're done having contact. Mm -hmm. But I think also too, that the woman couldn't get a hold of the social worker. And so she was going crazy. Again, yeah. being a mom, you don't know. There's parents that have cops called on them all the time that aren't abusive. And then there's parents that don't have cops called on them. Or mm -hmm. when they do, they don't do anything. And then their kids are, they wind up dead because, yeah. you know, the cops didn't do anything. It's just, it's such a, a fuck system. And I'm only one person, but enough, hopefully enough noise will be made to where I get more people that will speak up and I can use at least my audience to maybe make some some yeah. things. That's I think all. that's a that's a huge point too that you brought up earlier um, about your following being something that they should take into consideration, like as an important factor of why you are valuable in this uh, fostering situation. Like the fact that you're speaking, you're you're putting a voice behind this issue that's a 
you have a platform. Ter- yeah, a huge, huge issue that people need to know about and certainly don't know about. Um, well, crazy, though, I think that a lot of people, too, are, um, I don't know how, but they're not really keen on social media. I feel mm-hmm. like a lot of those people don't really mm-hmm. care, and, and they should. But nowadays, I feel like everybody's trying to hire like a PR person or a media person to handle social media. Mm-hmm. Another thing, too, when you have a foster kid and you haven't adopted them yet, you can't post any pictures mm-hmm. of that kid. You can't do any of that. So for me, that was another thing that I was worried about is how is this child going to be a part of my life? But my life is very, you know, in your face when it comes to social media. That's my job. That's what I do. So there was a woman that I found who takes in foster babies and she basically puts little, what are they like little mm-hmm. stickers? Emojis. Not, yeah. Yeah. Over yeah. their face. So she could still share her life. Yeah. And I thought that that was so interesting because I didn't know how I was going to do this. How am I going to take care of a baby all day? And people are like, where have you been? Yeah. You've been MIA for yeah. like five days. It's like, no, I have this whole new part of my life yeah. that I would hope yeah. that I could share, but to keep the family's, you know, privacy yeah. under wraps a little bit. So that's yeah. something to do as well as that you could hide it, but still show that it is part of your life, a way that you can live. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I have a lot of friends that I have come to mind that I want to connect you to that have had the same, same things that you're bringing up as hurdles. So oh, well that, I'll yeah, send you any that kind list. of help. I'm a yeah. one person right now, but if anybody's been through it, it would be nice just to at least yeah. bounce some ideas. Um, what, what age were you when you realized that you were interested in women as well? For women? Hard segue. Like Hard segue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're we're going to jump you're to like, that. Yes, I will, I will connect you with foster uh, people that I know. <laughs> so you're bisexual. How did that happen? No, no, no. It's okay. Um, well, because my, my last partner was a female who lived with me and my son was super close to, um, I've been attracted to men and women 12, 13, ever since I was a, I was a kid and I didn't feel weird about it. My parents never made me feel weird. I'd never seen anybody that was gay or bisexual. Like my, that wasn't my family. And a lot of people give me shit. Um, not a lot of people, some that are like, Oh my God, if you're gay in front of your son, he's going to turn out gay. I'm like, because I had so many straight, you know, experiences right. being raised. I never once saw um, anything happen like that. And I still turned out the way right. that I did. So nobody, I didn't really date a girl girl, like until people kiss and, you know, it's like cutesy or girls are bi when they're drunk. They're not bi. Mm-hmm. Um, I think my first real relationship was a female with a female was probably 18. I think I was 18 when... I had somebody that I would consider an emotional mm-hmm. connection with and not just fooling around. And that mm-hmm. was, and you had already had a boyfriend or boyfriends before that. Yeah. I think my first boyfriend, I was, I don't know, 10. Like yeah. it was like, Oh, this is my boyfriend. You kind of make it known. But oh, I mean, yeah. real yeah. boyfriend was like 15, 16. Yeah. What I've was, always, oh, sorry, go sorry. Ahead, go I've always thought that I was like, emotionally by, but not physically or sexually. That's what, um, I, that's what I say to women. Unless a vagina sitting on your face turns you on, it doesn't. you're not bisexual. Right. So yeah, no, that's that does not really turn tell. me on. But the thing that's confusing for me is like when someone says like, who's your celebrity crush? I'll be like, oh, Jason Momoa and Michael B. Jordan and Ruby Rose and Ellen DeGeneres. Like I'll list women in there because I am so drawn to them and so attracted to them. And like I, I have that. I've same feeling towards them that I would have with the men that I listed. Um, and I have fallen. I feel like I was completely in love with a woman who was straight. Um, she was a a playmate as well, but, um, she was straight. And so I never told her. And, um, I was like reading our text to a friend one time and he was like, I think she's in love with you too. Like, just tell her. And I was like, no, I like, She's, I've never seen her have a girlfriend. And he was like, she's never seen you have a girlfriend. And I didn't That's ask the thing that it, confuses but... women. And, and yeah. I think that you can tell if, if a girl's a lesbian, by the way, that they dress, I'm talking about like lesbian. Yeah. Um, but like somebody like me, I get a lot of girls and it pisses me off too. I get a lot of girls that will ask me for drinks. And I think, you know, that it's like, oh yeah, like let's go grab drinks. And it's more of the idea of being with a girl. And so mm-hmm. they'll flirt with the idea, but then if my hopes get up or, or I have like a, an emotional attachment and they just want more of like that cuddly best friend, I can sleep over and we can snuggle. It's like, no, mm-hmm. that's cute and all, but not when I have 
other intentions. Like I feel like I could be invested or I could feel the same yeah. way, male or female. Girls start to get that a little confused. Because like you said, you, you thought that you were in love with her. I've had guy friends that were my best friends. And I was like, oh, my God. Like I – we would be so great together and we would – we would have the best kids, but I didn't feel that like soulmate kind of like I need yeah, to be with you. I did everywhere. feel it with her. I did feel it with her and I felt the sexual feelings Connection. as well. Yeah. Like oh, I, I, yeah, I fantasized about her. Like mm-hmm. I, I was like, I really was all in for this girl and I just never told her because I, in my head, she was completely straight. And there were times in conversations that I was like, I think she can tell. And I think she's trying to give me the signal as well, but neither of us ever acted on it. Um, and, and now then we're here both we are talking and... about it and you don't know. Yeah, so you never know. If I you're think... listening. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> and since you know who you are. Just kidding. <laughs> no, girls don't know. Girl, when you dress super femme, unless you're at every gay bar, and even when I do go to gay bars, guys think that I'm – guys and girls think that I'm there with, like, my gay friend, like, mm-hmm. my gay guy friend. So unless you really put it out there, women that look like us will be considered either bi when they're drunk or – um, straight. Like it's, it's always people, when they see me holding hands with a girl, they, they double take like, really? Like the people look at me like, mm, are, you, are you sure? Or I get, um, you, you must have daddy issues. Mm-hmm. Like you, mm-hmm. like, no, no, I actually love my stepdad. Everything was great. Or That's interesting. you haven't met, you haven't met the right guy or you haven't, you haven't had good dick. I get that all the time. You just haven't. It's like, uh, I've had all sizes. I don't want to like, go into that, maybe, but. I think a lot of people sometimes think that like maybe a, an older female um, like did something wrong with you as a kid and then you got confused. Uh, yeah, it's, it's all you know. about your childhood. It's like, mm-hmm. no, well, well, I, what about all of the people that are gay that were raised in a great home? Nothing yeah. happened. It's just I, I don't have an explanation for why I am the way that I am. And I've gotten into conversations with my ex-girlfriend about this because she – for sure was like, I am gay. I've been gay ever since, you know, I could remember blah, blah, blah. And she dresses more masculine and people can tell that she's gay. And me and her sit down. We have amazing conversations because I've kind of not shifted her way to thinking that she's bisexual, but it's more of falling in love with the person, Mm -hmm. being attracted to the person. You can have a good looking guy walk by and me and her could be like, Oh, he's really good looking, but her body parts don't like speak to her in that. And I'm Mm -hmm. like, but because your mind's already telling you that you're gay, you know, you're gay. This is the way that it's supposed to be. You have to have a label. I feel like people aren't letting themselves really feel that they could have. It's so confusing. Exactly. The label makes it taboo. Yeah. And it's confusing for women because we're so confusing. And it's for me, sometimes I feel like a man cannot understand me. Like only a woman can understand me. Like I should just be gay or like, oh, like, you know, men are. Women say it all the time. Yeah. But then I also. But again, I don't feel like I'm bi. Like I, that it's confusing for me. I guess I feel emotionally. To me, I think it's, uh, like I, I've only found myself intimately attracted to men, but I'm certainly in love with a lot of my girlfriends. I have been over long periods. Of, I mean, I have girlfriends that I've had since kindergarten and whatnot, and. Even on this podcast, like Jade and I, uh, you're one of the loves of my life, Jade. Um, But no, but seriously, I mean, you make these connections in life and you fall in love with the people and you get to you get to have multiple partners, essentially, in that regard. And yeah, there's a difference between who you're going to like live with and spend time with and support each other on, you know, who you're going to sleep next to every night and all the little little usually annoying things that you have to deal with in those situations come along with it. You choose that person as well. But I don't see why it's so wildly crazy to people when they're against uh, any kind of bisexuality or gayness. Um, It's love at the end of the day, right? I mean, I think that they must have, they must have wanted to experiment, but because of religion or the um, homophobia in their home or something, maybe they like, you know, pushed it so far down that now it's like their only way to deal with that. Maybe just to keep it going. Yeah. It's like deep down they had that urge and that was their only way to control it. But the sad thing is, is women that are in their thirties that are like, I I always thought that I was, but I never was sure. And I never acted. And you have this thought, well, no, but that's, but that's why I'm such an advocate for being open with how I am. And a lot of people send me so many questions. And for me, it's kind of like, it's a no brainer to talk to them. Cause those, they start off with, um, I'm so sorry. This is probably too personal. I'm like, 
you follow me, you right. know, like it's, yeah. nothing personal. it's okay. But they're so worried about me judging or they're so worried about it sounding stupid. Mm-hmm. And if, if anything you take away from following me, it's, I don't judge anybody. Like I have, I have some people in their uh, professions that they do if they are females that I don't agree with. And I have a very strong uh, stance with that, but any questions or life experiences and, and anything coming from a genuine place, I'm not somebody to judge. In fact, I love people that can change my mind about things and make me really yes. think. And that's we one thing that, that I love. Truth. <laughs> yes. But without all of the the alcohol. And that's my, my ex-girlfriend <laughs> yeah. and me. Will sit down <laughs> and we'll talk so much about stuff that is just not the norm and people wouldn't talk about. And we really start to get going and I'll write like little notes like, Oh, I want to bring this up. And people are like, no, that's, that's weird. And one of the things was, if you weren't so sure that you were straight or, or gay, would you be able to fall in love or would you be able to have, take it to sexual intercourse? If you could forget that that person was not your orientation that you like to have sex with, if you were stimulated in a way, would you be able to have an orgasm? And my thing is, yes, I think you could. I think if somebody was good sexually, either way, you would be able to still experience that if you weren't, if your brain wasn't turned on. Like if, if you just let yourself. Like dozen of those were with a girl when, when I was young. So I think maybe that's where some of my confusion, um, like sexual experiences, like getting pleasure from someone else was with yeah. another, with a female. So I think that's another reason why. Do I, give maybe, us detail. Like, yeah, I was going to say, I'm like, wait, wait. So you've only been in love one time with a female. That you've was had sexual just, encounters with Like women. all of my first kisses and first makeout sessions, probably like the first six of them were with girls. Okay. Um, and to us, it was just having fun. Um, but it to me, like it felt just as good as the, fir- the other first six that were with guys after that, you know? So maybe that is where some of the confusion comes from as well. But I can only again, I know that there's no TMI with you guys and I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind that. I know no babies are listening at home. I've had more <laughs> orgasms with females and it's well, not, yeah. but no, no, no. But a lot of females too, I think, okay, question. I'm going to ask you guys when you see a naked man walking by and he has, he's excited. Okay. Does that turn you on? Do you think like male I nudity is that? hilarious? <laughs> okay. Okay. So it doesn't, it doesn't get your lady parts talking when no, that's a guy why I'm by. like why why ever send a woman a photo of um, you like that? a dick pic yeah like I why? have girlfriends that oh no I have girlfriends that love dicks what love. like they're I'm not it, saying that I think like ew that's gross but I'm oh, like no, but it's, <laughs> it's humorous to me it's funny <laughs> I, I, I've never I, looked I, at a guy walking by beautiful as they are and I've dated some beautiful men and women I've never seen a dick or honestly a vagina as well, where I'm just like, mm, I want to take care of that. I'm not, everything up here <laughs> has to be turned on and I have yes, to be in a good place. I agree totally. with you. I agree. I have that. to be in a good place. If we've had a fight, a lot of people talk about 100%. making sex. It's like, no. So once I started really maturing the people, the partners that I started to choose in my life, and I've been very vocal as well on people that I've dated, which has caused a lot of issues um, being so open, but I started to become more picky. Because you could have the most perfect, beautiful person physically, but if there's just like this back and forth, um, spiritually, mentally, um, your morals, everything that is just going to fizzle out so fast. Yeah. And that that's energy drained that you could have put into a way bigger connection, male or female with I either agree. relationships, friend, friendships, relationships, all that energy is being drained. I think because people are trying to have this perfect boyfriend, perfect girlfriend, yeah. perfect mm-hmm. life. It's like, no, like you get one shot at this, whatever your beliefs are after you pass away. All I know is I'm here right now. I have a son, his happiness matters, but also mine too. I can't, I can't live short term because I think I should be with this person. I want somebody, I don't care what you do for work. I don't care if you want kids or not want kids, but if you can make me laugh, if we can sit there and talk like for hours about shit that nobody wants to talk about, I'm already interested in you. You already seem sexually attractive to me. Because there's the saying, like, you have to, like, you have to sleep with my mind before you sleep with my body. And that my body parts will react to a good conversation, male or female. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love that. And I, I don't know if we're going to go on and on and on about this. And maybe we have to edit this down <laughs> later. But uh, I just wanted to say that, you know, I always pictured my love life ending up in this this 
fairy tale uh, met my soulmate experience. And it actually did, which gave me the freedom, strangely, to realize that I could I, I, that I have millions of soulmates out there. It's just a matter of making the connections mm-hmm. with them. So it's a weird kind of paradox that they're all over the place. Like there isn't this fairy tale, so to speak, the way that we've seen it in Disney movies and whatnot. It's more that you're creating those connections. So being vulnerable and being open and being open to love, what across all genders, um, and and also like you're saying, Jessa, across all creeds, all you know, cultural ways that people want to experience life and live their life being open to hearing and understanding what that means for them being able to have those conversations being able to come up against that that cognitive dissonance and absorb something new and have that liquid truth like jade is talking about which by the way liquid truth is this saying that we came up with on this podcast essentially that just means a growing evolving truth it can change. It does. It liquid oh, courage. Isn't, isn't liquid alcohol courage. Alcohol is also called as liquid. It's called liquid truth, right? Liquid I think courage. It's called a liquid lie. Liquid courage. No, guys. no. Liquid courage, yeah, because when you drink, things start to come out that you've been holding in. Maybe. And that's why people are like, oh, you are honest when you drink. That's, yeah, I thought it was called liquid hey, truth. It all works. We yeah, got it you. does. We got you. <laughs> um, but yeah, in any case, I feel like they're, we're all connected in one way or another. So it's just a matter of finding how you know and just a matter of figuring out how deep you can go with the connection how deep the other person is willing to go if you're super open and vulnerable and like you're saying there's probably times you match up with a person but they're only willing to go so deep and so you have to end it it fizzles out yeah well I think for me as well I have this belief and a lot of people don't agree with me and that's fine um I'm okay with my relationships being chapters in a book I'm okay with that. Mm-hmm. I never grew up thinking that there was one person for me out of all of these people that I would end up with and it would just be, you know, just done. And I would have this, you know, beautiful, you know, white picket fence house, blah, blah, blah. Because honestly, I was a hard worker ever since I could remember. So my idea of what a woman and a wife should be in a relationship was already kind of out of the norm. Mm-hmm. But I, every single person I was with, they were good people. Like every mm-hmm. single person, we just might not have, connected after a certain amount of time. So I call each relationship a chapter in my book where it starts to get a little weird is when you have kids or if you want more kids. And that's where the whole Angelina Jolie thing came in. And I was like, you know, I could do it on my own if need be. And if I want to, do I want somebody to come in and sweep me off my feet and change my mind about, you know, being with one person for the rest of my life? Sure. That would be great. But I'm also okay with cherishing and spending time with that one person and giving it a hundred percent. And if it works great and if it doesn't, you were an awesome chapter in my book that I learned from, and I'm only going to take the good and the bad into my next relationship and just, you know, apply it to that. Yeah. And a lot of women are like, oh my God, like that's, that's awful. That's so many, you know, that's so many men or women. It's like, no, but that's my happiness. I'm not going to yeah. stay with somebody because I should be with one person for the rest of my life, or I need to get married because I've hit 30 or I want more kids. Nobody else is going to tell me how to live my life. And there right. are like-minded people out there people are just scared to talk about it. Yeah. yeah. That thought didn't scare me before I had kids. I think that after I had kids, it did sound scary. What? Just, um, it being like a lot of different chapters. Like there's something I feel like maybe it's because of my upbringing, but like with my kids, I feel like now I just want to like, just give them And I'm not saying you are not going to be able to do this for Kyler, but like, I just want to be able to give them something where they know this is what the future looks like. You know, like this is who I like, like with my mom, she like dated so much. And so I felt like that kind of gave me some trust issues. And I know you're not, I'm not comparing you to my mom whatsoever, but I think that she was so extreme in that, that for me, I'm like the thought of that makes it like makes me scared, you know? No. And and for each mom too, it's also how you raise your kids, where you live. There's a lot of factors in it. And like I said, I raised Kyler very differently. Um, Mm -hmm. he's not like a normal child and he's already such an old soul that if he were any different and more sensitive in that way, or if there was things that I needed to worry about, then yeah, my happiness would come second because his Mm -hmm. structure and and how I raise him would take priority. And a hundred percent, I get that. But because I'm so honest and and I'm not the mom to ever say, don't do this because I said so, 
or do as I say, not as I do. We sit down and we talk about everything. Even if I'm mad at him and I want to just punch a wall because he's really on my nerves, he'll sit down and we will have a conversation like he is a peer and he'll know where I'm coming from. I'll know where he's coming from. So when it comes to relationships, he never looks at somebody that I introduce him to as somebody coming or going because each person that I've parted with has been on good terms because I've been so open. And he understands that just like I tell him, like, if you find one person, you're going to treat her right. You're going to hold the door open or him, whatever you want. And he knows that I'm always here to give him advice. I will be his guidance. His life when he gets older is going to be different than mine. He'll be different as a partner and it won't take him as long to trust male or female um, as it did for me. I didn't have that kind of guidance growing up where Mm -hmm. if I had a question, I could just go ask my parents. It wasn't Mm -hmm. like that. So I had to learn the hard way. And the older that I get, the more choosy I am with my time. So the more partners start to like dwindle down and not a lot of them meet him. It takes a while for me to introduce somebody to Kyler. So while I think that I have chapters in my book, he doesn't really meet that many. And I don't, Mm -hmm. I'm not a hoe. Like I definitely, (laughs) I don't want people getting more from me than I get from them. It has to be an equal partnership. Um, Mm -hmm. But the older I get, it's definitely, this shop has been closed for business for a minute until, <laughs> until everything here is good, especially bringing a new baby in. How do, yeah. how do you explain that dating wise? You know, Hey, mm-hmm. I like you, but I have a foster baby and guess what? I want to have like a few more there, mm-hmm. you have to meet the, the right yeah. kind of person to even be okay with that. And I'm okay with that conversation. If that person ever comes, you know, into my life. Mm-hmm. So how do you uh, compare, I guess, what are besides, besides the obvious physical differences, what would you say is different between dating a man versus dating a woman? Honestly, emotionally, they're the same. Like really, I've had some, I've had some crazy dudes. Like they, they have more tendencies than women. I've also had, have women treat me more like a princess than a man would. It's it's so weird how it could be completely opposite or it could be completely the same. You all, you have the same issues, you know, you have jealousy issues, you have, you know, somebody that's going to be more sensitive versus somebody that's going to be more, you know, aggressive. I'm technically, I am an aggressive person. I'm usually the man in the relationship in my head, at least male or female, cause I'm so dominant. Um, but I'm a good provider as well when it comes to, because I have Kyler, I know what it's like to be compassionate and sensitive. Mm-hmm. So me even meeting somebody that can tolerate how dominant I am is still hard in general. Mm-hmm. Most of the girls that I date are, I've dated a few girls that were femme, but a lot of the girls that I'm attracted to have a dominant masculine side. So Mm -hmm. that's kind of like this too. Same with a man. You know, I I do battle a lot with them feeling less than or feeling emasculated a little bit. Mm. And all it is, is each person that you date, male or female, it's just, it's give and take. And it's just, you have to be able to, to have good conversations with them and, and have them understand where you're coming from. That's all it is. Yeah. Mm. And you say that Kyler's an old soul. How do how do you explain to him when it's a woman? Does he? How did you have that first conversation with him? I don't think. Well, so my my ex husband's twin brother is gay, and he mm. just got he recently was married, and I think Kyler was actually in the wedding um, in New York. So he grew up with his uncle being gay, and I always taught him. Like he was going to the um, pride parade ever since he was three or four, oh, not wow. because of my, not because of my preferences, but I just wanted him to know what world we live in and people have different choices. People are attracted to different things. So I wanted him to focus more on the person than on the, um, on the, uh, gender. So mm. he's been very open-minded ever since he was little because he's seen in our industry too. Like there's a lot of makeup artists, hair people that are gay, you know, and he sees it. Yeah. He's never once been weirded out very close to my ex-girlfriend, like very close to her. And some of the girls that I have dated, he's, it's, it's so weird. That's what I'm saying. I don't, I can't give advice because he's just so good in that area that I don't, yeah. I haven't had any problems with that. Mm-hmm. I think maybe as he gets older, if I choose to be with a woman, maybe junior high and high school will be weird with friends, but I already mm-hmm. have to deal with that because of playboy, like he's already starting to figure shit out now. So it's, again, it's just really sitting them down and saying, this is my life. This is what I chose. You know, you're going to have shit that you have and I'm going to yeah. be there for you regardless. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's just honesty. That's all you can do. Cause when, if, when you lie to your kids, they're going to find out. Right. Yeah. I mean, my dad had some shit and I'm like, I already know you don't have to lie dad. Like, it's, mm, it's yeah. Cool. yeah. So no, that's, that's definitely, he hasn't had that issue yet. Um, and we do school events, me and my, um, my ex girlfriend, we went to a bunch of school events and people knew teachers knew Yeah. and he came home and he goes, mom, what's a lesbian? 
So we had that talk because he doesn't know words. He doesn't know labels. All he knows is people like who they like. Yeah. And so we talked about it, but that was the only thing I ever had mm. to explain to him. Cool. Does it, and he hasn't had any, but any, I guess, any run into anyone with an opinion like at school or whatnot? That- no, I think, I think that he has a few kids that have same sex uh, parents uh-huh. at that school. Um, and I believe that one of the teachers also does as well. So I don't think it's so foreign. And we're so lucky to live in Los Angeles that a lot yeah. of people, it's, it's, we could have a guy that's in his sixties, have an 18 year old girl, you know, and, and marry yeah. her and that's, that's normal true. and that's okay. But then we are weird about, you know, the same sex. So I think that we're just so lucky to live here because it isn't abnormal. Yeah. I, I don't know what to, to base it on anywhere else, but I'm pretty sure people have a hard time. Same sex marriages. Oh, for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you mentioned um, Playboy. So I just mm-hmm. wanted to ask what what originally got you to decide to do Playboy and is it something you would do again? Uh, no, I wouldn't do it again just because where I'm headed right now, especially trying to get into the um, becoming a foster parent and becoming more involved as a parent socially um, over social media and blogging, it doesn't make sense right now. But when I was growing up, um, I didn't really have confidence. I was very shy. My parents say that I was outspoken. I don't remember that. I remember having no real girlfriends. I was made fun of because I was poor. I was made fun of because um, I was stick skinny. I had a lot of insecurities and I didn't have the support at home to make me feel Mm -hmm. like I could just be myself. So I think all through my 20s, I was always searching for validation from females. I was always searching, you know, from men, not sexually, but kind of do I look pretty enough? You know, is my, is my weight okay? Like there was always something that I was worried about just because I remember it from, from grade school. And when I had somebody from Playboy approach me, I kind of laughed, like I'm divorced with a kid and I'm 27, like I'm, I'm old. And I'm like, no, like we want you to come and test. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to do this for myself. I'm going to try it, you know, just to see. I've never felt more proud of my body, more proud of being a mom and being asked to do that. I've never felt, I guess it it made me super aware of the power that I possess for myself. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of people say like, oh, Playboy, it's for men. It's like, no, 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 no. Like you don't even know how Playboy originated. You don't know the power that it gave women um, and in the era that it was, it was in, it was huge. So for me to be a part of something that iconic, it wasn't for any man. I didn't do it. I didn't care if men liked me or not. I did it for me. And from that, I met a lot of great people. I had friends, like girls that actually knew, you know, each other by first name, phone number. Like we yeah. called each other. We had that support, kind of like a sorority. I never had that. I was homeschooled through high school. I didn't have any friends in high school. So that gave me friends in that aspect. And also, after I did Playboy, I felt like I was on top of the world. Like I, I mm. watched my weight in a healthy way because right before Playboy, I had people telling me I needed to drop you know, eight, 10 pounds. And I was anorexic at the time, right before I did Playboy, I was so scared of a certain weight and I would just pinch skin and think that I was fat. So after doing Playboy, I felt like, no, like every woman's body is different. I saw women of all shapes, sizes, colors, everything. And they were gorgeous. Like all the curvy women I even were like, oh my God, I want her body. So once you're confident in your own skin, nobody can tell you anything differently. And, And that gave me a voice that I'm able to use now and to, and to inspire women or to tell women. I don't think that Playboy is derogatory. Like I said, I didn't do it for any man. I'm proud that I did it. My son, he's he knows that I did it. And when he gets older, that's something that I'll have to talk about to the extent of what I'm comfortable with talking about. Um, but no, he, he knows that nudity is just, it's nudity and it's how you take it. And if you want to mm-hmm. be a perv about it, that's your own judgment. <laughs> but if you have, he has, I have my girlfriends here all the time and we change and he's so respectful. We don't ever... Me and my family, if we're changing and he walks in, it's never, we never make it shameful. We never say like, oh my God, this is my, he knows nobody's allowed to touch you. He knows that you should be private, you know, about everything. But at the same time, we never want to make your body uncomfortable, whether it's weight, whether it's your genitals, whatever. I just want you to grow in a home that's loving, that's not dirty and I, I think shameful. Up, yeah. I feel like we put shame all. around our private parts. It's we like, we really do. No, we really do. And you look at like the National Geographic and and you look at all of these magazines, even even Vogue, where it's it's not sexualized. You know, girls, you know, nipples are showing. It's like, 
oh, like that's art or yeah. that's yeah. just the way. It's more of um, what the breasts are used for. And Kyler mm. knows like breasts are used for breastfeeding. He doesn't look at it in a sexual way. And I'm so thankful for that because he's not going to be raised to be a creep. I would beat that ass. He knows better. <laughs> he's a good boy. And he knows that women are much more than what their bodies look like. And he will respect that about women as well. It is weird that um, nudity is, it's, it's so weird, like the stigma we have around it um, here in the States. And I remember in Briz, um, was it? I was in um, Barcelona and I went to a nude beach. It was like people were literally playing volleyball nude. Like things were bouncing, you know? And that's, I mean, and nobody was, nobody was gawking. It was as if they had bathing suits on. Nobody was yeah. looking at anybody. And it, it was so comfortable to me. And um, yeah, I, it's, I feel like my experience was different with Playboy though, a little bit. Like there were some, um, well, first of all, I took it out of spite. Um, when I, they had approached me a couple of times before I said yes. But when I finally did say yes, I remember, um, doing it out of spite to the church group that I used to be in. Like I wanted to, because I knew that they thought I was on the pathway of sin. And I'll be like, I was kind of like, I'll show you the pathway yeah. of sin. Oh, so, <laughs> um, uh, but I will say that my first um, like shoot in the Playboy studio, I felt more confidence in my body than I had ever felt. There is a, um, a way that they, um, I guess, um, not worship your body, but uh, what is it like? Um, How they view it? Just the way that they, um, like, I, like art, I guess they were, it is. Yeah. That's yeah, how they make you but feel. There were other photographers that I shot with here in Texas, actually, cause there's um, a studio in Houston that there were like poses I wasn't comfortable with. And they would say like, Oh no, I'm going to crop it or no, it, there's a shadow there. And then the photos would come out and I'd be like, Holy hell. Like, and they're not, I, I didn't even know my right. hand was there. Yeah. Yeah. Know? But, yeah. um, yeah. So that was really, my experiences were a little bit different there, but, um, and then, um, you know, I did meet a lot of really close girlfriends at the mansion. Um, so I did grow into 18 different schools growing up. I never had, um, you know, the, I, similar to your story, um, where I didn't have like that sorority feeling. And I feel like I did get that. But when I stayed at the mansion, it was almost like ghost town. Cause you know, people would be there Thursday through Sunday night and then yeah. Monday through Wednesday it was empty and I would feel so spooked. And it just had like this creepy feel for some reason in my well, room. All the and girls think that it's a big party every single night. It's like, no, everybody's in bed by like eight. You're walking around. I was friends with the staff. Like yeah, I was too. just talking and rolling silverware with them. I'm like, this yes, is, I mean, me too. it's iconic to be I would sit in there. the kitchen and watch comedy with them while we ate chocolate cake. And that's fine for me because you know what's weird is these girls, and I saw some of these girls. It's so funny to me. These girls come in with their fucking Louis Vuitton suitcases and backpacks and they're just better than and they're flipping their hair and they're just treating the staff as if they don't matter. And then two seconds later, they're moving back, you know, home with their parents because they didn't make it in LA. And it's like, well, maybe you were just a piece of shit and not a good person (laughs) thinking that you were better than people. And you forget that every single person is going through something. Every single person deserves to be here. And, and that's a thing with aging too. Kyler knows like we don't put ourselves around any negative energy. I don't care who you are. My dad raised me that if you're not nice to the waiter, but you're nice to me, then you're not a nice person. And that's how I treat Kyler. I don't care who you are, what you could do for somebody. That's, that's not something that I will tolerate or allow in our space. And LA is the worst place to live. If that's, you know, the way that you think, because everybody's here trying to do something for them. They don't care about giving back. They don't care about reciprocating. They care about what, what can you do for me? And so to raise your children here, it's like, you just have to be so on top of that because before you know it, they feel entitled for nothing, like for nothing. And it's all over the TV and media. I mean, just that idea. Have you ever had like any of your ex-boyfriends degrade you because you did Playboy when in conflict? That's a good question. No. Like use it against you? No, I had, I had somebody that I dated that, um, they didn't, they didn't degrade me, but they had an issue with, men approaching me like they were more worried about me being hurt or or because I would have like some fans would send like they got my home address and they would send me shit to my doorstep yeah. so I think they were more scared of that aspect of it mm-hmm. of me being harmed and 
possibly Kyler, but no, nobody's ever made me feel mm. bad about it. But I'm again, like, you know me, like I don't tolerate you choose, that. So yeah. even if, even if somebody tried to, they, they would be gone. Like, you're not going to make me feel like anything yeah. that I chose was, yeah. was not yeah. right for me. But that's, I mean, just because you bring up the point of it can be scary being in the public eye, like with any, in any direction, whether it's nude modeling or not. Yeah, yeah. It could happen any any Mm -hmm. job. Yeah, well, I used to get notes under my hotel door in the Bellator hotels. They would find out what room I was in somehow. And I'd have like eight notes under my door. And it was like. It's so weird. Like the personal space is so important. I, I think too, a lot of people think that you're just not reachable. And no matter what I did, as far as like the sign or the signings and the meetups, like I love meeting people. I don't care who you are. If you come up to me, you're like, Hey, can I get a picture? Like I always will, um, unless I'm in a bad mood and, and I don't want to be mean to you, but I, I, cause I understand what it's like to meet somebody that you would like to meet. But when somebody crosses that line to where you feel a little threatened or scared, mm-hmm. that's where it's like, I, I didn't choose to do this to feel this yeah. way. Like this, you yeah. should know as a human being that any woman or man would feel a little bit uh a little bit terrified if you're showing up at a bedroom door or a hotel yeah, door yeah. that you didn't list or that you didn't say God. hey it's okay that's just that's the one thing we have to worry about and especially with having kids it's like what happens yeah, if they're trying especially. to get to you through your kid oh, I'll Mm-mm, I'll go to jail. I think also sometimes um, they don't view you as human, um, like not not boyfriends, but just people. Like I remember going on a date with this one guy and finding out that he was um, engaged, and I was like, "What are What are you doing?" And he was like, "Well, I didn't think this was going to go anywhere. You're Jade Bryce. Like you're not going to date me." I was just, and I was like, "You're like, oh, was, but what does your fiance think excited. about that?" Yeah, but I was like, I was excited about you. Like I had I had a few a few guys like that, um, and I just. I laugh like I'm like are you you're just a shitty human being yeah, like yeah. I didn't even feel like my time was wasted I felt so bad for the woman um Me but too. also I, too they yeah. they look at you like um you're like this doll in like a glass case to where they can't reach you so they do weird stuff like the dms that we get or they do these weird things oh. to get any kind of attention I and, love how you put them on blast by oh, the way I have no problem especially raising today's a son, was my like, favorite what Today's was my favorite with the man jumping. Oh, like uh, right into man. my vagina. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, how are we raising our men to, to court or woo women by, I was walking today at one of the foster meetings that I had today, I was walking and the amount of people that were like whistling or like cat calling. And I'm like, this is real life still. Like you see the mm. movies and stuff. What and do they laughing. think we're going to do? Like never right there be like, say, Oh, can I give no. you my number? Run. Like the never, ever, ever will a woman say never, that never will that work. Hey, how did you never your will it well, I was work. walking down sunset and he screamed, <laughs> Hey baby, you have a fat ass. And I was like, this is the man of my dreams. Yeah, never. never, ever will that happen. No, well, they won't get anything it. like, Oh, no. we'll, we'll, you change like, our face to being like, <laughs> that's the, that's not the reaction a man wants when he wants your attention. So it's so funny to see, but you know, it's, you know, it's the double edged sword is, or double standard girls can be like, ow, to a guy and guys are like, Oh my yeah, God. So off. Invicta like, has a male, he has, they have a ring boy and a ring girl. When I walk around, it's like, you know how it normally is when he walks around, they go they crazy. Go really? And not only is it because I think women are like, they get a little bit more raunchier with it, but also I think the men in there, when their wives, if they were to hoot and holler, the wife would be like, yeah. what are you doing? That's but the I'm men, saying. if their wives hoot and holler, they're just like, it's, she's drunk. Well, also <laughs> I think she feels like, finally, I get a fucking chance to do this where you've been doing this your like, whole they life. Go crazy yeah. in there for yeah. him. It's really funny. It's, it's just good when you have, a girl and a guy that does it to both. You know, you have yeah. a good looking guy, you're like, yes, bro. And then you're like, me. And then it's a hot girl, you're like, yes, girl. And then you have a guy. It's again, it's, it's the sense of like your ego being, you know, bruised or, or crushed. And anybody just, everybody wants to be acknowledged. Love, everybody yeah. wants to be treated equal. So when you have this like wife that's just always, you know, judging and like, why are you looking at her? Mm-hmm. It's so much energy. It's just like, are you serious? But when a guy walks by, you can sit there and be like, oh, yes. It's right. like, Come on, get over yourself. I've never understood that where like women start to flip out. Yes, but you're a beautiful woman. So I think it's hard to. You're confident. And yeah, it's hard to see from the eyes of someone who's probably suffering for whatever other reasons, and especially in her relationship. You know, I mean, and they see someone like you and they feel bad about themselves, you know. But also, even when I 
first did Playboy and I was anorexic, I thought I was hideous. Like I looked in the mirror and this was my prime supposedly. <laughs> I looked in the mirror and I didn't like what I saw. So no girl, every girl was better than me in my eyes. So mm-hmm. any girl that I saw that, you know, was remotely attractive was way better than I was. So I think that even if a girl's beautiful, most of the beautiful women are the more, more insecure women. Totally. The ones that mm-hmm. are going through their men's phones, the ones that, that are um, not True. keeping in tune with their the, with their spirituality and, and what's going on upstairs and in, in, in um, their ego um, point we, of view. We get consumed with the outside instead of the Yeah, outside. exactly. Females, yeah. It, we were just no matter talking what about you that are, yesterday. you are, shapes and sizes, you have this insecurity. And if you can start to detach yourself from that mm-hmm. and see all of the good and the beauty, you know, I, I see still today couples holding hands or people getting married. And I still think like, Oh, well, you know, they're, I, they're married. I'm not like, there's still things that I go through that I'm like, mm-hmm. people could think I'm living the the great life, but I'm still envious of the companionship of a married couple where people might look at me like, Oh, you could have anybody you want. It's like, well, no, no, I can't because my goals are very different. Mm-hmm. So I envy the people that found their partner and they're good. Like I envy that. So I think that mm-hmm. every single person's battling something sure. or envious of something. And it's just acknowledging what's good for you and what, what you need to do in your life. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think you're in your prime now. I think that like you're like in all ways, like it seems like you've grown so much in who you are and, and in your like a healthy form of confidence, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. But, and it, it's been like more with each year. I think I've known you about um, seven years now. And yeah. I notice like with age, it's, it has come more confidence. Um, how do you feel like you developed that in yourself these last couple of years, especially? I think it's from the people, really people watching. When I first moved to LA, that's when I had, I think, met you. I moved from mm-hmm. Las Vegas when I became a playmate. Um, and I thought honestly that I had like 50 friends because when you, have a title or if when you have something, especially in LA to offer male or female, you know, to, to know you and get you into these parties and do all this, everybody wants to be your friend. Mm-hmm. So I came out here thinking that I was just going to have the best time, you know, and mm-hmm. I, I was going to be this great big star. And then over time you start to see what people, what their intentions are. You start to feel like you're more lonely with a room full of people that mm-hmm. don't click or, or mesh or, or, or their energies are off you'd rather be by yourself. So I started becoming where you're more, less lonely. Yeah, exactly. I, I like my own company. I'd mm-hmm. rather hang out with my son or even kids more than some of the adults that I, that I have in my life. And so over time, I really started to kind of back away from a lot of the people that I thought were like my best friends, good friends. I had people that, that Jade knows that I, you know, were, were I consider best friends. And before you know it, they're, you know, hanging out with my ex-boyfriends, mm-hmm. you know, on planes with them. And we literally were crying over this person. Like she, you know, I had friends that would tell me you need to leave him. He's a piece of shit. And then two seconds later, you know, they're hanging out with him because he has parties and I don't want to be a part of that life. Mm -hmm. So once I started becoming more aware of where I live, what people do to you, what people think, um, where their priorities were, I started maturing in that way to where it's like, no, 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 I don't want to be consumed by this because I felt it to be wrong. I could have went down that rabbit hole probably married super wealthy or, or famous or kept, you know, acting, modeling, kept doing that. But something was pulling me in the wrong direction. It was, it was pulling me the opposite way. And if I were to have ignored how I was feeling, mm-hmm. I could have been miserable, you know, five years from now, 10 years mm. from now, and created such an ugly lifestyle for me only because I knew that that wasn't for me. Mm-hmm. So I think if you listen, I never knew what gut feeling was. I think if you mm. really, really start to pay attention to that, You're no matter how you yeah, no matter how you can explain your intuition, your gut feeling to yourself, if you really start to just let yourself just go through the motions, I think that you'll start to feel like you can pick out the rest of your life. Yeah. Like you can start mm-hmm. to, to put your, your, your steps and your plans, um, in place. Whereas I didn't know what the hell I was doing when I first moved here. Yeah. I yeah. just, I just kind of went with everything and I was, I was burning myself out. I was giving a lot of myself to a lot of people, whether it was helping them find their, um, careers, helping them get connected and I felt at the end of the day, I was empty and not that I need anything back, but I feel like it was, it was hurting my growth mm-hmm. and, and figuring out what I needed to do for my own soul because I was helping so many people and caring so much about everybody else that I just felt so like exhausted. I felt sick all the time. I felt like I was like, mm. physically sick and I couldn't explain it now that I'm older. I'm like, oh yeah, like I could tell if somebody's drained and I know why. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I think, I think that once you really start to pay attention to what you're feeling inside and not saying, well, I should be doing this. 
I, I, I should go to this red carpet. I should, you know, date this guy. You're shooting you all over yourself. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> you really are. It's like, no, it's, and as females, we live in such a great, you know, time right now that women's prime, I, I did this thing because a lot of girls ask me like, what do you do to your face? What are you like, you know, like, do you get injections, blah, blah, blah. And I just did this whole thing, a little montage of women who look better now, regardless what they did to their yeah. damn face. There's some girls that are 20 years old that look like they're 40. Okay. So it's like, yeah. you can just maintain a little bit, I, I but saw, there's women that look amazing now than they do when they were in their twenties or thirties. I saw a picture of Cher at 70 and she looked better than 20. Yeah. Jane like Honda, her, like, and her performance. I, she performed on Ellen the other day and she, yeah, she looked awesome. That's nuts. Um, so then you think that it has a lot to do with who you're surrounding yourself with? A hundred percent. And I think too, who, what you see when you look in the mirror, I think that that's mm. a big thing too, because like I said, when I was working the most that I had ever worked, when I was at the, the skinniest I'd ever been, when I was, you know, the demand for me to show up places was so high. I was so sad and I knew it, mm. but I put on a great show. Like I, I'm a pretty happy person, but something like, like I said, inside was feeling just off and I was getting physically sick. Like yeah. I was, I was not in a good place. And these girls look at our social media or look at, you know, our lifestyles and they're like, oh my God, to be you, or, right. you know, mm -hmm. I wish that I could trade places. It's like, but you don't know what we're going through. So until you really start to look at yourself in the mirror and say like something needs to change or, um, I'm going to give up, you know, whatever it is, it's not serving me anymore. You're just going to keep living this vicious cycle. You're going to age yourself no matter what, because you're fucking tired, you look haggard, you're, you're exhausted, but you're also going to age any kind of life experience that you really wish that you could be a part of. Like that's all going to be gone. Mm. Before you know it. Yeah. So I don't understand these women that are 19, 20 that are, you know, getting all the shit done to them, yeah. their bodies, their faces, because it's really hard to age yourself so early on, no matter if it's face, whatever, even like experiences and then be able to get your youth back yeah. at all. Like mm. I, I miss a lot of my youth raising my siblings. I can never get that back. So these girls are just so quick and even men so quick to, to grow up and start, you know, CEO of this company and doing all that. That's great. But you have to forget that time is the only thing that you can never get back. Money comes and goes, yes. weight fluctuate. Time is the only thing. So when I say, what is it like Billy Madison? He goes, don't you ever say that. And I can't wait till I go to high school, Billy. Because don't you ever say that. <laughs> All these kids are so like, they're so quick to say like, no, I can't wait to drive. Can't wait to be 18. Yeah. Can't wait to be you can't wait for bills. Yeah. You can't wait for that. Because My son's well, three and that. he already says he can't wait till he's five so he can go to school. <laughs> it's like conditioned in us. But yeah, I think that unhappiness is really like one of the number one things to age you. Mm -hmm. um, but speaking of the group though, like I remember – a lot of so I used to have a blast going with you to comedy shows. Um, I love comedy shows, and that that was one of my favorite things to do while I was out there. Um, but I always had so much fun with you. But something I did notice sometimes in the group was it seemed like um, a hunger in some of um, the people in the group to like get you to tag them and stuff. Like they, mm -hmm. I remember one girl um, on one of the first few nights I had hung out with you. One girl said, "Can you help me get followers?" Yeah, no, that's like, all the time. And one time I invited, um, I tried to have a girls night and I invited a bunch of girls, like probably, I'm not kidding, like 20 girls. And I can't, like at least half of them asked me who else was going to be there because it was almost <laughs> like, I was like, it's not a networking party. Like, Just hang out. Yeah. 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 <laughs> a funny thing too, I don't know if you ever came to any of my game nights at my house. I did. But, yeah. Okay. So when I did game nights, I, I would love to have everybody just leave their phones at the fucking door and just like not not going like any kind of social media, nothing. And so it first started off so strong to where people are like, all I want to do is meet good people and connect. So I was inviting people from like all like mm -hmm. different kinds of the woods, people that have reg regular jobs, photographers, mm -hmm. models, um, my family members, like it, it was, everybody was different and it started off so strong. And, and I felt such a good connection because I love making like not forcing people, but Hey, you know, get off your phone, talk. And people were just becoming friends with everybody that they normally would not have. And slowly but surely, as I started to become friends with more normal people and enjoying the company of people that actually weren't so like set on social media and who's going to be there, a lot of those people stopped showing up because mm. of no matter what kind of connection they got from that moment, the second that they left, it was reminded that like, oh, you know, my time is valuable. So mm. I should be hanging out with people that are the same caliber. Yeah, what, very, what does that very, mean? Like, very L.A. <laughs> yes. And that's, that's so sad. All I wanted to do was have people 
sit down and just hang out for a few hours, even if it's like a movie marathon or if, or if it's like a game night. Yeah. Most people want game nights. They don't want to play games. They want to just, <laughs> like, they want to come to say that they were there. No, I'm going to play Cards Against Humanity. I'm going to play, you know, Twister. We're going to do yeah. all that shit because it is a game night. The one thing that I will say, I miss, I miss my game nights the way that they used to be. Like, I really do miss that because being a hermit and really being protective of your energy, I think also you do miss that. What if, yeah. like, what if I would have tried harder and those people would have kept coming? Maybe they could have, you know, seen a different side of people. And that was always my goal, but I still live with that today to where it's like, I have those people I miss in my life mm-hmm. because I had so much fun with them, but they were just, they weren't where I am now. Yeah. They were still mm-hmm. chasing that. Like you said, that hunger, they were still chasing and there's nothing I could do no matter how normal yeah. or how I tried to make it more of a, um, girls night. It was a girls night. If girls were going to be there that they wanted to right. connect mm-hmm. with. Yeah. It's like, it's so, it's such a, it's such a but great, I go through that even in Austin. It's not, oh, it's not it just a there? California thing. I, oh. I go through that in Austin. I didn't so, know that. Yeah. It's not just a, a California thing. Um, it's, it's still a battle. It's interesting. Um, you know, especially now that people are making money back then we weren't even making money on social media. Now we are. So, um, and then once you mess with people's money, it starts to get a little, uh, totally. and I, and I still get girls that are like that. It's not so much anymore because I kind of, I don't do that. Like, I'm not going to sit there and connect people just because they asked me to, if we're not friends, there's, there's no reason like you're, you're benefiting, but you don't ask me how my day is going. You like, you don't care. So when, when that stopped, I started to feel a little sense of relief, but still nowadays people come up with, um, Oh, I have this charity I'm starting. Hey, can you help me? And they start to guilt you a little bit more. And you're like, fuck, like it's everybody's getting so tricky on how they do it. Or they invite you to an event that sounds good. And then you get there and it's all, all the wrong people and you're like, and I'm going to leave now. <laughs> so yeah, you just, you just have to be, just keep your, your head on your shoulders the way that you've always been doing. And I think that people will start to get the hint that you're not going to be taken, you know, or a map. And I yeah. think that a lot of women especially feel, feel sad. Like they feel lonely out here in LA. And I think that's so unfortunate. Social media really goes into that as well into loneliness. Cause you are seeing everybody, at, they're only posting what they're doing and if you're not doing anything and you're at home then you um you know can feel a loneliness and i know that you have a, a massive following i think it's like 1.1 1. 1 million uh i think when i was looking at your page um what are your thoughts on the influences both good and bad that social media has on today's generation i think every single person has a love hate relationship with social media yeah like it's, it's afforded us so many great experiences and connections a lot of the people that i've met that I become good friends with. And a lot of my relationships have all been from social media. I don't really go out and I'm not really going to go to a club. I'm not going to go to a bar. Um, the people yeah, I, I met you on Twitter. Yeah. And I, and I met a lot of my relationships. I slid into the DMS or they slid into mine. <laughs> so I'm grateful for it. But what bothers me and I find it so rude and people do this and I think they don't even know that they're doing this when you're at a dinner or a lunch, or if you come over to somebody's house and you're hanging out to spend time with them and you get on your phone and you're just scrolling through Instagram you're not even making eye contact Especially with if person. you're talking to them. I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. Like, uh, am I, am I, <laughs> am I boring? It's, it's so weird. Or like I went to a movie the other day with, um, with a friend and he was going through in the movie, going through his Instagram, just like scrolling. I'm like, oh my God, this is that bad. Kills, that like, kills this, me. Yeah. It's, it's, it's disrespectful all ages, to the art all ages. as well, you know, like so many people put into that film. It's like their art piece and you're just. And whoever's you know? behind you because that light is yeah, right. Like you don't. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, th- I mean, again, I love social media because of the, the people that I've met, the experiences that I've got to be a part of, um, the, the reach that I have. If I want to, you know, continue with the fostering as far as posting about it, if maybe I can impact, you know, some some other um, children's lives by bringing them, you know, with their and forever that's home. That's the biggest perk. Yeah, that's so again, like I hate it, but then I love it because there's nothing else that that travels like social media does. Like, totally. you know, you get one thing out and it goes viral and it changes people's lives. Totally. Yeah, that's true. So, there are a few questions we like to ask all of our guests. Okay. And I'll start off with what advice would you give your 25-year-old self? 25. Um I think that age was around the time that, cause I was 24 when I had Kyler. So I think that it would be 
to be more present as a mom at 25 Mm. because that's when I became a playmate and I was working so much and I can't get any of that time back. And and I missed a lot of that because I felt that it was going to, my career was going to just drop because I saw so many girls come in and out of um, modeling and I was older. So I'm like, this isn't going to last forever. So I thought to give him a good life, I had to just work, 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 work. And I do love working. I am a workaholic, but I could have taken way more care of what the priority should have been Mm -hmm. and balanced it. So I wish that I would have been more present in his life and balanced motherhood and everything that I had going through, um, or what I was going through being a playmate. Yeah, Mm, That really hits home for me today when I was trying to get ready for the podcast. Soul had, um, like his pretend vacuum cleaner between his legs. And he was like, I don't, he didn't, I don't know what he was doing. He was like doing some sort of dance, but it was making so much noise. And I was trying to prepare for the podcast. So I was like, soul, you can do that, but can you do it in your room? And he goes, it, like I saw his like, cause he was trying I'm to make sure me do laugh. It for you. Yeah. Yeah. And I didn't realize that until I saw his whole like shoulder Demeter. drop. And he, yeah. he looked at me and he goes, don't you think I'm funny? Aww. And it like, it broke my heart. So I was like, okay, I'm going to set this to the side for a moment. Cause he only had like 30 minutes till he went to bed. But yeah. um, it is, it is a daily struggle to try to um, do all the things that I'm doing in my career and try to build my career and be present with toddlers because they need so much attention. So I'm about to find that out all over again. Right. So that's, <laughs> I'm looking forward to that shit. Yeah. <laughs> no, um, I, that, that's what I would probably say if I had to choose. Yeah. That's really great advice. Um, if you could have, the next question is if you could have the whole world read one book, which would it be? The power of now. hundred hmm. percent. The power, of now. the power of now. Yeah. A lot of people were trying to get me to, to jump on The Alchemist. I, mm-hmm. I read that book twice. I, I don't connect to it at all. I like but it, I, but it's not life changing. Yeah. No, no. I would say The Power of Now. That really opened my eyes to a lot of, as far as like my ego and really understanding being present, that definitely changed the way that I live my life. Yeah. The Power of I've Now read... is actually the book that kicked me off into my own self help journey. Yeah. So really? Interesting. Yeah. I remember and that. The Alchemist, I read prior to that, but I, you know, I think it's a book. Because I feel the same way you do about it. It's a it's a strong book, but it's not something that's going to change my life. I, I don't buy it for people. It's beautiful. I don't it. People swear by it though. Like, oh, this really. I'm like, I've, I've tried. It's tried. a beautiful story. I think. But it I has, yeah. I think there may be something to do with it being more of a male aspect, like coming from a male perspective, and maybe it speaks more to males wanting that sense of of, of independence and freedom, and what the book. Is this the feminist side of you coming out? <laughs> Hopefully, because I'm really, really working. I'm, She's trying just, to cultivate her feminine yeah, energy. I've decided this this month is my kickoff. I'm trying to <laughs> to cultivate this other side. But anyway. You know how I found out about The Power of Now is Eddie Alvarez used to read it before going mm-hmm. to fight. Like yeah. that would, he would read it in the room before He'd he would it. go fight in the cage. Yeah. And that's so I would I see that. And that's one of the ways that I found out about that. But um, I do love that book, but I've read A New Earth three times. Have in that. I've, I've skimmed through that. I haven't really sat down to read it. Another one that people told me um, about, and I do like it, but it's not life changing, is um, mm-hmm. You Are a Badass. Oh, like girls, eh. girls I have are it on obsessed. Audible. How about and... The Untethered Soul? Love it. Oh, no, I don't think. It, no, I haven't uh, read that You'd one. You'd like that one, I think. Really? Like that. Um, you Are a Badass, I have on Audible, but I just. There's something about the cover, I think, that is not. <laughs> I don't know. It's not. You know, too, a lot of things that people tell me, like, oh, to get it on um, Audible, I have to feel the book. I have mm. to, like, I love the pages. I tried to do the Kindle thing once, and, and I was like, I, know. I hate this shit. Like, I can't do it. Um, but people say, too, driving. I tried to really um, start to, when I commute, like, really, like, listen to things. And I, for me, it's just not clicking. So I think that every book that I read, I really sit down. I try to give 100% yeah. to it and really try to dive in. That's why I gave The Alchemist um you know, another chance because I just couldn't yeah. say like it did nothing for me, but I, I, I couldn't do it. So the yeah. untethered soul, I'll, I'll do that one then next. I love audiobooks, but, uh, I agree. It is nice, especially when it's like self-help where well, you if need you're to on... do some exercises out of the book or some follow yeah. alongs, but podcasts are always good to listen to yeah. when you're driving on the, I, you know, I, I <laughs> listen to a few of them and people again, swear by them when they're driving too. I'm such a music person. Like mm. I, I blast some weird shit and it <laughs> makes my day. Like my life, my life could be going so shitty and the right Michael Bolton song could come on and I just turn <laughs> it up or even like easy. Like it's so yeah. weird how like a song could just change your mood. And yeah, that's why really with me can. driving, 
that's like, that's what I have to do in order to like set my day. So yeah. I think maybe chores like doing like housework would be good for a podcast or um, mm, especially if it's like a, a feng shui topic. Just clean to, and clean and like clean. That's like the best yeah. one to listen to um, when you're cleaning. Holy heck. I need to get also cleaning. get some um, podcast people from you guys then. Send me a list oh, of people yeah. that you okay. guys like. Yeah, we will. We'll send you our list. Subscribe, subscribe, <laughs> subscribe. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, okay, so if you could whisper one phrase to everyone on the planet, what would it be? This is going to sound so corny. Um, I would probably whisper you are enough. Like, honestly. Oh, I love that. People are so worried about everybody else. And, and again, it goes back to social media. So worried about what their neighbor has, you know, what that girl has. And it's like people just start to really start to it's nitpick themselves. And they just having a kid too. He's on social media or like not Instagram, but, you know, YouTube. And he's like, I need to have that because he has that. And never once are people just like, I'm enough. Everything that I do matters. And, and even if it's a small little footprint, like it's it's mine. I think that that's the one thing that I wish that I could tell my siblings, you know, my family members, everybody that is going through something. It's like, all you have to do is be your own number one fan and you're going to get through it. Yeah. I like that. Thanks. Yeah. I love that. Um, so we do have one question from the magic mob, which is our tribe of listeners. Um, uh, so one of our uh, listeners wanted to know what your relationship like is like now with Dan B and at, or Dan Bilzerian. I'm, I, I don't even know if I'm saying his name right. Um, and how do you view his type of current fame? Let me, can we just preface that for listeners who don't know Dan Bilzerian? I guess you could categorize him as the most infamous man on social media. I don't know. <laughs> besides yeah, yeah. Trump, oh, besides you... Trump, I don't know. But no, when I would he, say that he he's known. He originally was known because he was p- for poker, right? Or no? Yes, yes. Okay. I met him when he was a poker player, and his lifestyle now was nothing like the yeah. lifestyle that I had with him, like at all. And so I don't know him so much now. We're still friends. We're still cordial. We still talk every once in a while. So it's not bad at all. But I know him as the person that never went out, never went to clubs, never drank i've maybe seen him have a beer once or twice in my life um wow. when we were dating so his lifestyle drastically changed when we broke up but he was a good boyfriend like we you know i never he never cheated on me that i know of like there's nothing that i see now when people are like oh you dated him it must have been it's like no like the, i don't know the person on social mm-hmm. media that everybody knows yeah, so yeah we're homebodies yeah, we never. Do you we think never that it out. kind of stemmed from y'all's breakup, that lifestyle, or maybe freedom? Maybe you know, because social media was so big at the time, it was still new. So I think that that just kind of spiraled, and then he got a lot of traction from that and kept going. Honestly, I I would consider myself a feminist, and a lot of girls give me shit because I do consider myself a feminist that I dated him. Um, again, he wasn't like how he is now, but. If I were a dude, honestly, I would be the same way. Like, I still have such a big masculine side to me that why not? I, I don't know how he is with women. I don't know how he treats them. Um, all I know is how he was to me. And so if I were a single dude, I would be living it up and partying and doing everything that he's doing. As long as he is happy, that's all you can really want for somebody. Mm. Yeah. <sighs> okay, so... We've got a pick your poison question from the magic mob, which are always super fun. Okay. I'm excited. So here it is. <laughs> Would you rather be able to eat anything you want to eat and stay in fabulous shape or go the rest of your life without sex? Mm. Okay. Wait, sex with people or like sex at all? Like does masturbating count too? I'm going to say you can still masturbate. Okay. So then, yeah, I would rather eat everything and <laughs> wait. I mean, cause nobody can, <laughs> what is it? Do you like to do it yourself sometimes? Like, no, nobody can ever get you off the way that you can. So that's an easy one. I don't even have to think about that one. All right. You'd be like pizza every night. Yeah. Every <laughs> single night. Doesn't matter. Cake, everything. And I'll take care of myself when I'm done. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> what about you, Jade? Mm. I really love enlightened ice cream and Halo Top. 
so much. I and say like tantric enlightened sex or something. Uh, <laughs> enlight- there's a um, brand called Enlightened Ice Cream, apparently. You know, like once you have toddlers, it's like, what? Sex? What is that? Yeah. 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 Um, so currently, I would choose the food, I feel like. Um, but, you know, sex is like, it, there's so much, if if it's in the space that Jessup brought up earlier about the mind, there's so much of a connection there and it can be, you can feel like you're in outer space, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, currently I would choose the food, but my answer probably would have been different before toddlers. And once they're a little bit older, my answer would probably be different. Why do I have a feeling I know what you're going to say? Why? Because I'm (laughs) smiling? Yeah. I already know you're going to say sex. I'm going to say, here's the thing. I would choose sex because, well, of course I love sex. I mean, we all love sex. That's not up for debate here. But I have never had like a great relationship with food as far. And I've been lucky enough to not have, you know, real weight issues or any eating eating disorders. But my digestive system has always been a problem. So like the foods that you guys probably really enjoy, I probably can't even fucking eat them. So it's like. Well, what if you could, though? What if you I don't even ever <laughs> That's the problem. I've never really. It says no consequences. Yeah. The thing is, though, have I ever experienced that without consequence so that I could know that that would be the better option if it was? I do know I like sex. Hmm. So, okay. I know no, that's a enough. fact. So I'm just saying. <laughs> all I'm saying is I don't know because maybe I can't even compare properly. You know, like I, I don't know that eating a whole pizza and then a bucket of ice cream afterward would be so euphoric that I could. It is. I've never really been is. able to like do that. I would literally fucking it's die. So... Shakies <laughs> and cold stones. It's that's that's a night. I'm gonna tell you that. I'm gonna tell you that. But make sure you tell you. your husband your answer because I'm sure it'll make him feel real good. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Well, I mean, he would pick food. I already know, but <laughs> <laughs> that's really funny. Oh shit. Um, <laughs> all right, Jessa, last question for you. Where can people find you out there in the world on social media and the like? I would say the best before I would have said Snapchat cause that was my baby. Cause that was the most raw realist that you could ever find, but nobody's really on Snapchat anymore. So, um, I'm going to say Instagram and that is at Jessa Hinton. Hmm. Cool. Easy enough. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, by the way, I, I'm always been obsessed with following you, but I really love how whenever you post yourself in almost any outfit, but especially the cute ones that I'm all into, I can always click the photo and find out where you got each piece on the cheap. Usually, yep, sure do. Thank you for doing I don't spend that. Money on that. That's a yeah, service to women everywhere. Somebody just said that to me today. Um, she commented. She's like, "Thank you for you know listing that you get things for cheap because yeah. a lot of women are so you know." What, really like it, it matters that much who the label it is looks everything so looks good fucking on you cute. it looks expensive yeah it, it's not what you wear it's how you wear it but i get a lot of people that will ask me where something's from and i'll say target and it's either like really or like Ugh. like <laughs> you're welcome i saved you just like 50 dollars right now on this t-shirt that you know was seven dollars come you, on now. you know they're already at target.com getting that shit <laughs> as they're talking shit, they're, yeah, talking they're, shit. they're not yeah. gonna say that it's target no. but they're gonna go yeah. buy it yeah no you're welcome thank you <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think we're good, Jessa. That was it. So thank you so yeah. much. You're amazing. Having me. This is actually really fun. It's just like catching up with girlfriends. That's why we like the Skype thing because we can yeah. see each other and see our reactions and make faces. And you know, that. as as the this um, podcast has been going, I've seen myself get um, oilier and, and oilier. Oh, me too. My air conditioning <laughs> me is too. off. Somebody told me to turn it off. Oh, my God. Look at this. Spray tan. Thank you, Mercedes. <laughs> Thank you. Jess's got. I thought uh, it was going to be boob sweat. Yeah, she's got spray tan blotches on her white shirt because I, mean, yeah. I made her turn off the AC. Too, guys. You're doing it for the, the listeners. You're doing it for the I magic am. mob, Jessa. I am. I am. So, I mean, it was worth it because I definitely had some good topics that even made me think a little bit. So, thank you guys for having me on the show. Thank yeah. you. We love thank you. you so much. We love you. We need you. to catch up. Let's hang out soon. I don't live that far away. I was going to say, your ass is like, 40 minutes away. Yeah. And well, that's without traffic. Let's be real. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody didn't live in Texas, then we would uh-huh. invite you. I'll be there in December. We'll, we'll Skype her in. 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, while I'll be I on my couch. Pizza, you can eat pizza on the other end and then you can have your fucking salad or whatever it is that makes your balls tickle. I don't know what it is that you like. <laughs> Nothing fun ever. <laughs> That's why I okay, so tickle I balls afterward. Sure. All I'm saying. I can't turn this. Okay. So I have to make sure that I press stop. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, let's just get a clean buy. Uh, did you already press stop? Nope. Okay. Didn't. Jade, let's just get a clean goodbye because we trickled into all kinds of other shit because <laughs> that's what we do. Yeah. yeah. Um, so just, let's just say like literally as clean as possible right here. All right, Jessa. Thanks for coming on. We love you so much. Yeah. That was a blast. We love you. Well, thank you guys for having me. All right. Take care. Bye. Yay. All right. Girl. Um, I wanted to ask, but I didn't. I figured we'd probably. Wait, am I stopping? It. No. Oh, you can. It doesn't matter. Just leave it until we're done talking. Okay. okay. Um, I figured we would edit it out. But um, do you think that Dan's happy? I get a lot of people that ask that, and people that know him tell me no. Like I still get people that that talk to him and still are friends with me. When I see him, because I've seen him a few times since um, within the last year, and he. He likes to point out everything that he has and, and mm. all the new things he has. Which usually but, means no. But, but he happy. forgets who he's talking to because right. I don't give a shit about that. So I think that that's something that he enjoys when I'm around him is that I don't want anything from him. And he's so used to offering and he is very giving. Like he is a very giving person. But I think that as you get older, it starts to all become the same. Like after you've been doing that for so long – it just becomes repetitive and not nothing enough. excites you yeah. anymore. And so that's the one thing that I wish that he would find somebody that I knew him before all of this. So anybody that he meets knows him as this and what he can offer and all this great shit that he has. So I just, I hope that he finds somebody that doesn't care about all of that. Mm. And that will be a good companion for him in every single way. And I think that's the one thing with social media it's a blessing and a curse that you can yeah. meet so many great people, but you can I, also meet some shitty people. I think that Jackson Roman had that relationship with him. He didn't really want anything from Dan and he was such a positive, um, positive person to be around. I was extremely close to him before he passed, but, um, he did, uh, and again, we're not going to edit this into the show, but he did say, I remember telling me one time that, um, he felt like Dan was one of the most depressed people he'd ever been around. And he thought that's why Dan liked to be around him so much is because he was so positive. Mm -hmm. um, so I wasn't sure if, what your view was I on that. I could see but. how, it, especially once the social media chaos spot started, you know, snowballing into this big thing, it's hard to even go back and say, wait, I want to change directions. I want to. Well, he also got upset too because he had had, um, like a photo shoot or something at his house and a photographer reached out to me and asked me if I want to do it. And my response is like, no, like I'm never going to do a photo shoot at his house. Yeah. Like that's fucking weird. He's my ex-boyfriend. And he took such offense to that. Like I was better than, and he was less mm. than he took it so weird. And I'm like, no, Dan, you don't understand. Like I can't be seen with you. Yeah. Like there's some of my girlfriends that know Dan from before, like when I was dating him and they're like, you guys have such great chemistry even when you hang out because they've seen me when the um, shooting happened in Vegas. I drove out there with a few friends and we went and we gave food to um, all the first responders and we did all this. And Dan actually offered to use his like big utility uh, truck thing and we loaded all the food on the bed, blah, blah, blah. And everyone's like, well, you guys are like normal together. Like you're not Jessa Hinton and he's not Dan Bilzerian. You guys are just like, yeah. you're just normal people. And even if, if that were to be true and for some reason we both woke up tomorrow and we're like, Oh my God, we should just get married. And I could never be seen with him for yeah. everything that I work so hard for or stand for or believe in. I can be friends with him and I can support him. But if we're ever hanging out, he can't post my name. Like he can't post me in a picture. Like I don't want any of that only because mm -hmm. of the life that he created, not him, not him as a person. Cause I love him as a person. I was with him for, for a while. And still to this day, like I love him as a person, but at the end of the day, what I'm teaching Kyler is, is so important. And I saw Dan with Kyler actually at his new house. He bought a new house in LA and invited me over and he goes, bring Kyler. So I'm like, okay. So we go and Dan's comments were like, if your mom wasn't stupid or if your mom wasn't you, this would be your room. And like, Oh, oh you, we can't oh my here. God. And I was like, no, like we're, we're done here. Like yeah. you, you can't do that to him. Cause of course Kyler's 10. He wants yeah. all the fucking little shit. So he's like, mom, wake That's up. Terrible. And I'm like, 
I'm gonna fucking kill you. I can't imagine. So that's another thing too, in this lifestyle that you have people that will flaunt everything and just throw it in your face and dangle money. And if you know me, that's kind of a deterrent. Like if if you do that, it's like, it's, I can make my own money. Like I, I don't, I don't need your money. I don't want your money. And if that's the one thing that, Hey, my name is oh, so-and-so and I have yeah. this. It's like, no, no, I'm good. But thank you. I, I wish the best to you. So when you for him, with, I really hope. When you lead with that type of stuff that your money and flaunting and that type of thing, you're going to attract people who only want you for that. Yep. So it's just a silly exactly. way to go about it. I still have people texting me too. It's so weird. And especially with a lot of the people that I've dated before, um, They'll text me nowadays like, oh, he's with so-and-so. And I'm like, I don't care. Like, yeah. I, haven't been, I haven't been with him in five years, six years. And, so oh, I funny. heard Dan was – I had dinner the other night with a friend of mine. And he goes, yeah, I saw yeah, I saw so-and-so flying with him. And I'm like, okay. Like, you really stopped our I ate a banana today. Like, yeah, I was just like, it's like squirrel. Like, I don't, I don't get that. So <laughs> the people are so infatuated with him and, and his life – that I don't actually it, follow them. No, neither do I. But a lot of <laughs> men and women do. And it's like either they love him or they hate him. Most of the time, and Dan, show me some of the fucking DMs he gets from girls. It's disgusting. Girls are raunchier than men. It is so bad it's how why? women would. It, it, it's funny because we we're just talking about like how women can cackle at men and like do yeah. all of that. And it's like, okay. Mm-hmm. The DMs that he showed me, it's like girls are so desperate. He told me that girls would rather a shout out than a hundred thousand dollars. Like wow. a shout out is that valuable. That's fucking sad. That's scary. Well, because it has to do with validation bias on yes. media. I mean, that's yes. what you know. It's that's why social media is so dangerous and what we're putting it on it too. Yeah, it's, like it's influencers are responsible for the fu- the fucked up girls we know. You know, I know. that our influencers are responsible. They're supposed to be responsible for what we're putting out there, but we're not being. And what's funny, too, is you see these girls, and that's why I loved Snapchat so much, because I would go on these fucking rants, and you see these girls traveling around the world and, you know, living this life, and you have women that look up to them. You have younger girls that are like, when I grow up, I'm going to be that. It's Mm -hmm. like, you're going to be a hooker? You're going to be... I was like, take... At at Mr. Model? (laughs) Yeah, I don't care if you're a prostitute, if you're an escort. Stop saying you're a model. Yeah. Stop saying you're a blogger. Stop lying. Just say, like, I am a pimp. I am a hooker. And be just fucking truthful because everybody's looking up to these women who are beautiful and, you know, plastic surgery. Do what you need to do. But at least know that your influence is still valid to somebody. Yeah. Like, you're still reaching somebody and you're you're being deceitful. And that's what I don't like. So I'll go on these rants and people are like, yes, preach. Say it like it is. And I get a lot of women that are mad at me. I get a lot of women that are models that will say like, oh, leave, leave women alone. You're supposed to be this feminist. I was like, yeah, but we didn't come from where we came yeah. from and have the things that we have today because we're still depending on men. Like we're still needing men to, to validate, to pay for our stuff, to, you know, create our happiness. I'm like, that's not what a feminist is. So yeah, I stand for women and our equal rights and doing the things that we need to do. But our youth is also dependent on what we're producing right now. Absolutely. So it's so funny how like I have women that I'm friends with that are just like, we don't talk anymore because of mm-hmm. my views and how I feel that women should be perceived as. 